add your queso fresco and your jalapenos. Make sure you're removing the seeds from your jalapenos because I don't want you guys to get older and then have, you know, some problems with those seeds. Today we're making enchiladas, but these aren't just any enchiladas. These are enchiladas mixtas, and in order to get the best flavor, you have to make fresh chicken broth. So don't worry, I'm gonna show you today the steps to get the perfect chicken broth for your enchiladas. Let's start by adding a whole chicken into our pot. Add 11 cups of water and continue to boil on a high heat for 15 minutes, and then you wanna remove the impurities. Once you remove the impurities, you're going to add half a purple onion, three green onions, one leek, three bay leaves, half a garlic bulb, a pasote, and one and a half tablespoons of salt. And you're going to continue to cook on a medium heat for another hour and a half. Oh, that smells so good. This is medicine for insomnia. <laughs> it saved me a little cut. Guaranteed to have everybody in your house relaxed. So if you have some teenagers that are sassing you, make sure to make your chicken broth ahead of time and have it handy throughout the week. You also want to save your onions and your garlic because we're going to need that for our salsa verde. I was like, my garlic's hiding somewhere and it's over here. <laughs> We're gonna quickly make a salsa verde and you're gonna need a bunch of cilantro, five roasted poblano peppers, our tomatillos, our serrano, and our jalapeno. It's gonna be nice and juicy in here. We're also gonna be using the garlic and the onion that we used for our chicken and now we wanna blend until smooth. Oh yeah! Woo! Woo! Love it, love it! Woo! Se puede! And boom, done! Once you blend in your ingredients, you're going to place them in your pot. We're going to use two cups of fresh chicken broth. We're going to shake this blender and we're going to pour it right in. Place your burner on a medium heat and continue to cook for another five minutes. In this pot, I have three cups of our chicken broth and I'm going to add about four ounces of mole paste. I showed you guys how to make this from scratch, but you want to use the one that you absolutely love. And if you're in a rush, you can get them at the store already made. So just pick the one that you love the most. And I'm gonna keep stirring until I dissolve the paste into the chicken broth. Once your mole is nice and smooth, we're ready to start rolling up our chicken enchiladas. I want my enchilada sauce a little bit runnier today, so I went ahead and I added one cup of chicken broth to make it nice and smooth, just like this. In this mixture, I have half a cup of crema fresca and half a cup of Mexican sour cream. Some queso chihuahua, or your favorite melty cheese. Purple onions. Some cilantro. And you're definitely gonna need some more salsa verde over the top. 
Don't be shy with it. Just douse it, smother it. Enjoy your dinner today. And definitely some more mole. Now who's ready for a delicious bite? I'm gonna need somebody very special to say a uh, It's Thursday and I want to inspire you to make this recipe any night of the week. Shrimp or chicken fajitas are quick and easy to make and absolutely delicious. We're going to be seasoning our fajitas with some olive oil, taco seasoning, Mexican oregano, and a little bit of flour. If you don't have access to a taco seasoning, not to worry, I'm going to leave my suggestions in the description area for you. In yesterday's recipe, it was brought to my attention by Cloud that someone was displeased with the way that I flattened our chicken. I hope that this one looks a lot better for you. And to be honest, this is a home cooking show. We are busy, we are taking care of our family, and you have to make it comfortable for your home. Now our chicken has been butterflied and pounded really, really thin, and make sure that you clean your shrimp really good. I really love making this recipe because once you find a seasoning that works well with your family and that you fall in love with, it's super easy to get through dinner. I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of all-purpose flour to our shrimp, the same to our chicken. Once you coat with your flour, you're gonna add a little bit of Mexican oregano. If you don't have access to Mexican oregano, you can use marjoram. And then you're gonna drizzle some olive oil. Make sure all your pieces are coated with the olive oil. That keeps your protein nice and juicy. As I've said before, if you allow this to set 10 to 15 minutes, you're gonna get the best flavor, but if you only got a minute to let it set, guess what? That flavor is gonna pull through. I've allowed our griddle to warm up on a medium high heat for a good three minutes. And once you place your chicken, you wanna cook it for three minutes on each side. Once you cook your chicken, you wanna set it to the side and you wanna place the foil over it to keep it nice and warm. Then you're gonna start cooking your onions and your bell peppers. Now it's time to start placing our shrimp on our hot, hot griddle. And the shrimp will cook in less than a minute. Once your bell peppers and your onions are done cooking, you wanna go ahead and add a little bit of salt. I'm gonna add a few purple onions. Yes, in English it's red onions, pero soy mexicana and we call them cebolla morada. Ooh, delicioso! If you have family that likes spice, you can sear your jalapenos, your serrano. It's gonna be up to you. I hope you're hungry today because I am ready to serve. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say uh Today I'm making ground beef tacos dorados with the delicious warm salsa. And we're gonna get started by warming up our tortillas in some hot oil. That way when we're folding, they don't break. And the thinner your tortillas are, the better for this recipe. And see, it's gonna be super easy to fold. And that's the way we like it. I'm gonna season one pound of 80-20 ground beef with one teaspoon of onion powder, garlic powder, ground cumin, black pepper. I'm also gonna add half a tablespoon of oregano, half a tablespoon of chicken bouillon, and then I'm gonna mix until everything is well combined. Once you combine your ingredients, you're gonna start laying out your tortillas because we're gonna start filling these tacos. And I know sometimes you look at recipes like this and you think there's no way that ground beef is gonna be fully cooked. Well, it's gonna go into 
a lot of oil and it's gonna cook and it's gonna fry to perfection. You're gonna take about a tablespoon and a half and you're gonna start placing it and you wanna press, press. It's gonna look like a half moon. Just like that, and you're gonna continue with the rest. You wanna check your oil with a wooden spoon, wooden chopstick, a toothpick, and when you get a vigorous oil, that means that you're ready to fry. Allow your tacos to fry for about a minute and 15 seconds on each side. Oh, it smells so good. And give or take about two and a half minutes, your tacos are ready. And for added flavor, I like to sprinkle a little bit of salt as they come out of the fryer. Now let's finish making our salsa. You're gonna take three to four tomatoes and one serrano and you're gonna boil it until it's nice and soft, okay? You're gonna add it to your blender along with a small bunch of cilantro with half a lime juice. Pour it in. Sprinkle a little bit of salt. And now we're gonna blend our salsa but in all actuality, we're just gonna pulse a little bit because we don't want it to be super smooth or super chunky. And boom, almost done. You wanna add about half a tablespoon of Mexican oregano right at the end. And now it's time to assemble our tacos. And I like to serve this recipe with either lentils or some fresh pinto beans. Add some of your salsa and a little bit of queso fresco. If you're not sure if your patty's gonna cook fully, look at that, it just fries up. It's nice and hot and beautiful. And these are those end of the month tacos that go perfect any time of the month. <laughs> How many are you gonna eat? Who, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> you squab. How many are you guys gonna eat? <laughs> I think I can handle four. Four? You know what? I can easily handle about eight. I know you can. I am not even playing. Somebody wanted that one. So is it <laughs> Ooh, this salsa is so tempting. Just perfect. Wait, we're not done, we're not done yet. And some crema fresca. Now I'm gonna need somebody very special to say uh And we're back with another delicious recipe. Today we're making chicken al pastor. This recipe will have your mouth watering, your taste buds will be dancing for joy with the flavors of your pineapple and your spices. A true bite in heaven. Let's start by adding our pre-soaked guajillo chilies and pasilla chilies into our blender. 3.5 ounces of achiote paste, one chipotle, one bay leaf, four garlic cloves, half a tablespoon of ground cumin, one and a half tablespoons of salt, one teaspoon of ground ginger, one fourth of a teaspoon of cinnamon, three cloves, one teaspoon of black pepper, a little bit of rosemary, one tablespoon of Mexican oregano, three-fourths of a cup of apple cider vinegar, three-fourths of a cup of pineapple juice, and one cup of orange juice. And now we're gonna blend until smooth. And boom, done, time to marinade. Since we're cooking this on our stovetop, I went ahead and I sliced my chicken breast very, very thin. Now, if you're gonna be grilling this chicken, I suggest you butterfly it, marinate, and then grill. Once you've properly sliced your chicken, you're gonna add your marinade. and start giving that a loving mix. 
Some of you have time to marinate your chicken. The best flavor is going to be 12 to 24 hours. But if you're moving quickly and you need to feed your family, allow this to marinate for one hour before cooking. The flavors will still pull through. And lucky for us, I love to cook and I already marinated some of our chicken and now it's time for us to cook it. I allowed my cast iron to heat up for four minutes. The smoke just started coming out and now you're gonna add a little bit of oil. Place your chicken on your hot cast iron and continue to cook for four minutes on one side. Do not move it because we want a lot of searing marks. And boom, done. I did cook my chicken in batches. Your max cook time for your chicken is gonna be anywhere between six to eight minutes. And then it's time to eat. But don't go just yet. We're gonna do something really delicious right after I finish taking all this chicken out of my pan. <laughs> I thinly sliced some pineapple and I'm just going to add that to the pan. And you just want to cook your pineapple for about two minutes just to get all that sweetness to come out of our pineapple. And boom done! Time to make some tacos. If you're cooking on your stove top, I suggest you allow your chicken to rest for a good five to eight minutes before you serve. I'm going to need somebody very special to say, uh... And it's Monday and I want to inspire you to make an easy recipe that tastes just like chiles rellenos, but it's much easier to make. Now let's get started by preparing our sauce. Over the weekend, I was able to meal prep a few ingredients that I'm going to need for this week. I roasted some tomatoes, poblanos, and I sauteed the onion with two garlics. To your blender, you're going to add three tomatoes one medium onion and two garlic cloves, a little pinch of Mexican oregano, one tablespoon of chicken bouillon, and I like to enhance the flavor of this broth by adding one eight ounce can of tomato sauce and two and a half cups of water. And now you're gonna blend until smooth. And boom, done. Place your burner on a medium heat and drizzle a little bit of oil. Next, you're gonna start straining your blended ingredients. You wanna make sure to strain your blended ingredients because that's gonna make for a delicious sauce. Once you fully combine your ingredients, you're gonna place your burner on a medium low heat, more on the low side, and you're gonna to continue to cook until we're ready to serve. And I just used a small little bunch of cilantro to add a little bit more flavor to our sauce. Now that you prepped your sauce, we're gonna start slicing three poblano peppers. And you just wanna slice them into smaller little squares. In this bowl, I have one cup of Chihuahua cheese. You can use mozzarella or any kind of melty cheese that you have access to. Then you're gonna add your poblano peppers into your bowl and you're gonna sprinkle about one to two tablespoons of all-purpose flour and make sure everything gets coated. This little step right here is gonna allow all our ingredients to stick closely to our batter. Before you start separating your eggs, you wanna make sure that your eggs are room temperature. And if you've tried making chiles rellenos before and you have a difficult time keeping your peaks, that's okay, you can add half a tablespoon of cream of tartar to your egg whites and I'll show you where to add it. And today, you know what? Um, I usually don't have a difficult time, but I'm gonna add it just so that you guys know when to use this. You wanna make sure that you get no egg yolks in your egg whites. This is the part where you wanna add half a tablespoon of cream of tartar your egg whites, add your whisk attachment, lock it. We're gonna start at a low pace and then we're gonna start picking up the speed. Give or take after two minutes, you have some beautiful peaks and we're ready to start combining our ingredients. And I'm just gonna transfer our beautiful egg whites into another bowl. Mix your egg yolks just a little bit before you start adding them slowly as we fold. She reminded me of Carlos Sainz making his pancakes. <laughs> Delicious. And this tip that I'm about to show you right now was passed down to me by the lovely ladies of my family. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of flour and I'm gonna fold it in. Sometimes when you get chiles rellenos or these little beautiful uh, cakes, what happens is that they end up tasting more like oil than the egg batter itself. 
And by adding a little bit of all-purpose flour, you're gonna transform your little egg batter into something that your family is gonna be requesting you to make often. And that's why we're here. I have to make these again. <laughs> the total amount used is about one fourth of a cup of all-purpose flour. Now you can start sprinkling in your cheese and poblano mixture. Give it a fold. Sprinkle in a little bit more. You can use the same batter for your tuna or shrimp patties as well. Okay, we're ready to start frying our little cake. And these are quickly fried, so you're gonna flip them and be careful. Nice and fluffy, just like me. And you want to continue doing the same with the rest of your batter. And it's a custom in our family to add a warm tortilla at the bottom before serving. And I said warm, not crispy. So it's just a quick little, little dip. And the cook time for our sauce was around 15 minutes on a medium low heat. What you do, you place your little patties over your corn tortilla, just like that. You wanna serve with your choice of beans, and then you pour your delicious sauce. This is one way I serve for my kids that don't like super um, smothered things. They're selective about what's smothered, but you wanna serve them just like that. Well, smother me, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at my older age, I'd rather have it smothered. But for the kids, you want to serve it just like this. And then send it off. And if you have family that prefers a more traditional style, you can just place your little cakes inside the broth. Smother them with a lot of love. Because sometimes when you have a bad Monday, you need something really good to eat. But we're having a good Monday. I'm having a really good Monday, but sometimes Mondays you're not ready to say goodbye <laughs> to the weekend. So. You just start placing it in there, you know, and it's your job to bring some of that loving feeling to your family. I said feeling instead of feeling. <laughs> Both are equally as good. <laughs> and boom, done. Who's ready for a bite? I'm going to need somebody very special to see. Uh... Mm. Oh. Oh, that does taste like a chile relleno. It does? Mm -hmm. Did you know the, the first time I made chile rellenos, because this is a recipe that I like somebody to make it for me, mm -hmm. was on a mukbang and that I used to do in my room. Oh, that's That cute. was the first time I made the chile rellenos because they had started asking me to make recipes since then. Mm -hmm. Like, let me just make it mukbang style. Yeah, it's so good. It's such a childhood mm. comfort. Oh, wow. So good. Yeah, definitely roasted tomatoes on the grill mm -hmm. make a huge difference. And roasted Mmm. For those of you that have made chiles rellenos, when was the first time that you ever made chiles rellenos? It's an intimidating recipe, but it's actually pretty simple. And we all end up doing it for love. Mm -hmm. And it's usually for a man. <laughs> <laughs> Except today. Except today. I did it for two sweet boys. Mm. I want to eat like 10 of them. They're so light. Hello and welcome. Today we're making juicy al pastor ribs in the oven. They're so tender, they fall off the bone, but I highly recommend that you make some tacos. Since we are going to be using a variety of chiles today, we're going to go over them. The number one chile that we tend to use here on this channel is Guajillo chiles. You can find these at most of your Mexican grocery stores and even in just any kind of grocery store, they're likely to have these. Uh, what you want to do with these chiles is you want to take them out of your bag. You want to remove the stem and the seeds. So if you choose to use this chile, you're not going to cry. It's mild. Even if you use four or six, you should be able to handle it. But if you can't handle spice at all, just go with one. It's going to enhance the flavor and the color of your dish. The next chile that you want to use is your pasilla or an ancho chile. 
These sometimes get mixed together. You'll notice that some are long, some are short, but at the end, you're gonna get the flavor that you need from these chilies, which is a, a nice little kick, a smoky, earthy, fruity flavor. With this one, what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to toast it on your stove in order for it to get warm enough for you to remove the stem and the seeds. And here is a favorite that you might recognize, your chipotle in adobo. If you can't find your chipotles in adobo, you're not likely to find them dry unless you go to a specialty Mexican market. But I suggest to get a good can of your chipotle. And these do get spicy depending on the brand that you're using. So start with one and then the next time you make the recipe, you can also add another and then you can adjust to your liking. And don't act like you can't handle the spice. You love these because they're just roasted jalapenos. And if you want your ribs to get sassy and talk back, I definitely suggest that you use some chiles de arbol. This is a spicy senorita from all chiles. If you can't handle the spice, but you need a little bit of a kick, start with half. But if you really want to bring in some heat, I definitely go with three and then adjust after that because with all the spices and seasonings that we're using, you're bound to scare someone. So take it easy. And the chiles that you're soaking is your guajillo your pasilla, and if you chose some spice, you're gonna add your chiles de arbol. To your blender, you wanna add six ounces of pineapple juice, eight ounces of orange juice, three-fourths of a cup of apple cider vinegar, your softened chiles, two chipotles in adobo sauce, two tablespoons of Mexican oregano, one tablespoon of ground cumin, half a tablespoon of ground ginger, half a tablespoon of black pepper, two tablespoons of chicken bouillon, half a tablespoon of salt, six pieces of clove, the spice, four garlic cloves, two bay leaves, and if they're small, you can add a little extra one, 3.5 ounces of achote paste, and if you don't have access to achote paste, you can use two tablespoons of anato powder, one teaspoon of cinnamon, these next two ingredients are optional, but they enhance the flavor of your rib. You're gonna use one teaspoon of coriander powder and half a tablespoon of liquid smoke. And now you're gonna blend until smooth. And boom, done, let's coat our ribs. Let's start by removing all of the moisture from our rack of ribs. This marinade is gonna be good for up to eight pounds of ribs. I'm gonna show you how to slice your ribs for your tacos and how to slice them for your barbecue grilling. See, if you were to slice right here, you would only have enough meat for uh, one little taco. You don't want anybody to get sad, so I'd go up here into this bone right here, and then you wanna start slicing. And by doing that, you get to coat all of your rib, and when you place them in the oven, every single person gets a piece of the charred parts that we all love. And this piece right here is the one that you're gonna be serving for your barbecue plate. I'm only gonna add a little bit of our marinade into the bowl, and if I have any extra marinade left, I can place it into my freezer for later use. You'll get the best flavor of your ribs if you allow the marinade uh, to rest and soak up for a minimum of 24 hours, but if you need this within the hour, I think a good hour should give you enough to shine with your family. And when you have your ribs sliced up just like this, it's best to marinate them in a bag. You'll have more space in your refrigerator, allowing you to make more ribs. Because once you start with one, then everybody wants to eat the whole rack. So you have to have enough. This is what it looks like when it's been resting for 24 hours, soaking up all those delicious seasonings. So this one, I'm going to go ahead and place them into separate little baggies in the freezer for later use. And now you're gonna bake your ribs in the oven at 350 degrees for two hours with the foil on. After two hours, you're gonna remove the foil and that's when you're gonna begin coating your ribs with a little bit of pineapple juice to enhance that flavor we all love from Al Pastor. In this bowl, I have a little bit of pineapple juice and I'm gonna add a little bit of honey. Give that a loving mix. And then you wanna start coating your ribs. They're gonna go back in the oven and you're gonna repeat this process two more times. And you're gonna ask, why are we gonna do this two times? So that we can get a beautiful and delicious crust. And remember, no foil for this part. And boom, done, our ribs are ready. 
as I mentioned, fall off the bone, delicious. You want to pour your favorite salsa over your ribs? Perfect. Ooh. And then you're just going to give a quick coarse chop. Because by this time everybody's going to be staring at you that they're hungry and you want to get this done quickly. I like to use our guacatillo salsa for this. Cilantro and onions will never fail you. Salsa verde. And a slice of pineapple. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh, the hardest part about making these tacos would be the time you have to wait to marinate and the cooking time in the oven. Aside from that, it's going to be super easy to make and super easy to assemble your tacos. Just need a little bit of lime. Mmm. These are absolutely delicious and I'm going to tell you why. All the seasonings that we prepared for our ribs come through with a little touch of sweetness once you squeeze a little bit of lime juice on it. If you don't squeeze a little bit of lime juice, you're not going to get those flavors to pop in your mouth. So if you don't like lime, I'm worried about you, but you're going to have to this time around and look away because it's about to get dangerous. Mm. It's Wednesday and I want to inspire you to make an easy and affordable dinner. And it doesn't get easier than some delicious rajas mexicanas. Let's start by roasting six poblano peppers until they're nice and charred. After you allow the poblanos to sweat for a few minutes, you can start removing the stem, the roasted skin, and the seeds. Now you can start slicing them into little strips. Place your burner on a medium heat and drizzle a little bit of olive oil. Add half of a large onion, and you wanna to continue to cook until your onions are nice and soft. That should take you about four minutes. Once your onions get translucent, you're gonna go ahead and add two garlic cloves your poblano pepper, and one heaping tablespoon of butter. Give that a loving mix and set your burner on a medium low heat. Add one cup of corn and give that a loving mix. One cup of Mexican crema, one teaspoon of chicken bouillon or you can use some salt. Once you combine all your ingredients, you're gonna add your desired amount of melty white cheese. I'm using queso chihuahua today, mozzarella works, queso Oaxaca. You just wanna sprinkle that over the top. Add a little pepper and continue to cook on a low heat for about two to three minutes. And boom, done, some delicious rajas cremosas mexicanas. So if you like creamy food, you guys are gonna love this dish. Before I serve your delicious rajas, let me show you how I like to pair this recipe. I used two large chicken breasts, I butterflied them, and then I pounded them until they were nice and flat. Last time I made this recipe, my kids loved this buttery Kinder Steakhouse seasoning, and that's what I'm going to be using today. You can use whatever seasoning you like, and I'm also going to leave a suggestion for you in the description area. As you can see, when I use the Kinder seasoning, I get really happy and excited, but a little bit goes a long way. It has really good flavor, and it really does pull through. Once you season your chicken, you're going to drizzle a little bit of olive oil and then you just want to make sure that all the sides are coated. It's usually best if you allow your chicken to set with the seasonings for about 10 minutes, but if you're in a rush, guess what? Even one minute will transform this chicken. Place your burner on a medium high heat and allow your griddle to warm up for a good three minutes. And you want to continue to cook for three and a half minutes on each side or until you see the broth is coming out clearly. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you're welcome. 
Yes, you need a little more protein. Go ahead and take a bite of that chicken. See, you don't have to stress too much over making dinner. You can get it done in less than 25 minutes. Mmm. Don't forget to dip your chicken in that sauce. Mmm. Agarrame, me voy a desmayar del gusto. No, please don't. I still need you in my life. <laughs> this is so good. It's perfect. Bravo. Bravo. These poblanos came through. They taste so good. Ooh. Do you think they're spicy? Mm -hmm. They have such a delicious like floral uh, flavor mm -hmm. that just captivates you. You don't want to stop eating. Look away. My mouth just got watery in my mouth. Tonight's dinner's lentejas. And to make a delicious broth for this soup, I used the remaining bits that I had left over for my rotisserie chicken. And what I did was add two bay leaves, half a tablespoon of garlic powder, and I added two heaping tablespoons of chicken base. I used a total of eight cups of water. I pressure cooked for 45 minutes and allowed for a slow pressure release. And then we have this beautiful and delicious, luxurious broth. Before you start this recipe, you wanna soak your lentils in enough water to cover your lentils for a minimum of 15 minutes. And what this does is that when you strain the water from here and you add your lentils to your pot, it's not absorbing all the water and you're left with mush because we want this a little bit soupy. I'll be pairing my lentils with buttery corn tortillas and I like to allow the masa to set for at least 10 minutes. That way it helps us uh, form our tortillas a lot better. I'm gonna use three cups of instant corn masa because I need a lot of this masa because everybody usually wants two or three of these tortillas with their soup. Make a little well and you're gonna add about two and a half to three cups of water. So if you see that it needs a little bit more water then you can adjust and add a little bit more. And the recommendations on your masa package is pretty accurate. Once you fully hydrate your masa, you wanna make it into a nice, beautiful ball. You see, when you pat it down, you can see how nice and hydrated your masa is, and that's what you're going for. Go ahead and place it back in your bowl, put a plate over it, and now it's time to make our lentils. Place your burner on a medium high heat and drizzle about half a tablespoon of olive oil. Once your pan warms up, you're gonna add two minced garlic cloves, one medium onion, two Anaheim peppers, and three tomatoes. Continue to cook until all your ingredients are nice and soft. That should take you six to eight minutes. This right here is what's gonna add the flavor to your soup. Mm -mm -mm, that smells so good and looking so beautiful, just like my sister. <laughs> Once your ingredients get nice and soft, you're gonna add half a teaspoon of ground cumin. And allow that to toast up just a bit. Mmm, you smell that? Mmm, amazing. Well, it's time to stir. Next, you're going to add two carrots and two zucchinis. Two medium potatoes. Your two cups of lentils, make sure to strain the water out. And your eight cups of chicken broth. Good old Pyrex. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and place your burner on a high heat and allow this to come to a vigorous boil. And don't put a lid on it because everything's gonna boil over and that's more cleanup for you. And once you achieve a vigorous boil, you're gonna switch your burner to a medium heat and you're gonna add a small bunch of chopped cilantro. And Corazon, if you don't like cilantro, you can just skip it. That's just for flavor. I think if you wanna add a little bit more flavor instead of cilantro, you can use a little bit of Mexican oregano. And we're gonna to continue to cook for another 15 minutes. I actually make these tortillas a lot faster with a cutting board than a tortilla press. Right, 
when it comes out, you want to be careful because you don't want to burn yourself. You're going to start pinching your tortilla and make little mountains. In Spanish, you call them montañitas. What do you suggest if someone does not want to do this when they're hot? You can use a paper towel or a kitchen cloth to aid you, and I'll show you that on our next one. Man, if you're kidding, you're coming home from school to this Ooh. meal. <laughs> you know how that feels. It's so comforting. Anybody coming home to this meal today would be so loving. Hey, I'm thinking of the kids, okay? Los pequeñitos lindos. Yeah. They deserve the best. They do. So if you don't like the heat, you can use this, put it over, and just pinch off instinct and see what happens. You're all set. Ooh, I love that. Boom, done. <laughs> and even if you didn't fully cook your tortilla that's okay we just need to get warm enough to make a mold and if you see the little edges like that it's going to be perfect to contain the butter so even if you can't make your lentil soup today and you don't know what to make for dinner you can make these tortillas quickly with a side of eggs and you're set and pinch a little bit of salt over the top and let that butter melt and give or take 15 to 20 minutes your soup is ready to serve. When you use a rotisserie chicken, you get that beautiful buttery crust at the top that you know that when it goes in your mouth, it's just gonna melt. And boom, done. Our lentil soup is ready. Now I'm going to need somebody very special to say, uh... Hello and welcome back. Today we're making crispy shrimp taquitos. And you know that when you buy a pound of shrimp, you end up with almost nothing. So in this recipe, I'm going to show you how to keep your taquitos crispy and how to stretch this recipe. You want to use one pound of clean shrimp. You want to butterfly them and start chopping them up. Once your shrimp is finely chopped into a nice little paste, you want to season it with your favorite seasoning. The seasoning I'm using today is half a tablespoon of garlic powder, half a tablespoon of onion powder, one teaspoon of paprika, one tablespoon of maseca, one fourth teaspoon of white pepper, one teaspoon of Mexican oregano, half a teaspoon of cumin, and half a teaspoon of salt. And then you just want to fully combine all your ingredients. I like to pair the shrimp taquitos with some potato taquitos. That way we can stretch this recipe and you want to season with the same seasoning and half a cup of sour cream. And then you just want to fully combine all your ingredients. And you're probably wondering, Steph, how do you know what's what when you're serving? I'm going to show you right now. In order to get the crispiest taquitos, you need to make sure to warm up your tortillas. Now to distinguish what kind of taquitos you have, I use the yellow corn for the shrimp and the white corn tortillas for the potatoes. In this bowl, I have one tablespoon of all-purpose flour and I gradually add water until I develop a beautiful paste like this. And when you're making shrimp taquitos, you don't wanna overstuff these. One, because we don't have that much shrimp and to be honest, you don't need to. You're gonna tuck it in and roll them up really, really tight. And you want to do the same with your potato taquitos. While my oil heats up, I'm going to make a guacatillo salsa. And all you need is avocado, tomatillo, and jalapeño. And if your avocados need a little bit of help, you can add a splash of water. And if you're going to keep this in your fridge for a few days, go ahead and add a little bit of lemon juice. And boom, done. With an uncoated wooden spoon, chopstick, or toothpicks, you're going to place them into your oil. Once you see vigorous bubbling, that means that you're ready to fry. And you want to continue frying your taquitos for three to four minutes or until they're nice and crispy. And once your taquitos are nice and crispy, you're going to start taking them out. I do want to say, if this is your first time making taquitos, please do not crowd your pan. I've been making taquitos for years and this comes with experience. I want you to be safe in your home, especially with your frying. And for those of you that test your uh, oil with water, I'm worried about you. Get an uncoated wooden spoon, unwooden wooden chopstick, toothpicks, and just keep it, wash it, and use the same one over and over. Or use an air fryer. 
Yep, you can use the air fryer, perfect. I want you all to be safe and happy. Now it's time to fry our potato taquitos, but you have to be careful because these babies tend to pop. So you kind of have to put like two or three down and then see how your potatoes are acting, if they're talking back, and decide if you're gonna be putting more in here or not. When you see that potato come out, you just go fishing. Take it out because that's what's gonna end up popping on you. And ooh, nobody wants that. All right. Let's get ready to assemble our plate. This is gonna be so, so good. And if you want a recipe for this shrimp rice that pairs well with most Mexican seafood, I'll go ahead and link that in the description area for you. Then you're gonna do one shrimp, one potato, one shrimp, and one potato. Two potato, three potato, four. <laughs> You need a lot of Mexican crema and some queso fresco over the top. And boom, done. Who's ready for a bite? I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh... Mmm. making a fully seasoned birria blanca. This recipe is perfect for your festivities and also for those that don't like spice, but I don't want you to be turned off because this is a fully seasoned recipe and I'm also gonna show you how to spice it up here at the end. Now, in order to get the best flavor for your birria, you're gonna need to get a piece of beef bone. Today, I'm gonna be using beef bone marrow and I'm gonna combine it with a piece of chuck. So if you don't wanna use chuck and you wanna get fancy, you can also use ribeye, but these are my favorite combinations when I make birria. And I'm using about half a tablespoon of salt to season our beef. To your blender, you wanna add one tablespoon of thyme, Mexican oregano, coriander seed, half a tablespoon of ground cumin, ginger, marjoram, half a teaspoon of black peppercorns, six pieces of whole allspice, six pieces of clove, a small piece of cinnamon, and now you're gonna blend. And boom, done. Place your pot on a high heat and you're gonna add your beef bones. Then you're gonna start adding your pieces of beef. You wanna add 13 cups of water. Allow your pot to come to a vigorous boil for about 20 minutes. Then you're gonna come and remove the impurity. Once you remove your impurities, you're gonna add one large onion, one whole garlic bulb, six bay leaves, our blended spices, four tablespoons of chicken bouillon. Give that a gentle and loving little mix. Continue to cook on a medium heat for two hours or until your beef is tender and fall apart. Make sure to come and check periodically, stir it a little bit just to make sure that nothing's burning. And if you're using a big pot like I am, I just wanna let you know that I'm using two of my burners. So please be careful and let your family know that you're using two burners not to go near the stove. And you know we like our spice, so today we're gonna make a garlic chili oil that goes perfect on everything, but you have to try it with this birria. I have a total of 20 chiles de arbol, but you can adjust to taste. So if you just wanna try it with like three, that's okay. What you're gonna do is you're gonna put them into your little blender and you're gonna pulse a few times. You don't want this too fine, you want this to be flaky. That's the chile bingo, you know the balls in there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you think I'm corny? Then you're gonna pour into a glass container. I have one cup of oil and it's nice and hot. So you can use an uncoated wooden spoon, a chopstick, some toothpicks, and once you have a little vigorous bubble, then you're gonna add 12 thinly sliced garlic. Some of them are super thin. So just do the best that you can. You're gonna toss that right on in. Be careful not to burn yourself. Fry up 
fry your garlic until it turns a little bit golden and that should take you about a minute. Perfect, now we're gonna pour this oil gently into our pepper flakes. Add one tablespoon of salt and crack some pepper. <laughs> this is Cloud's favorite. She asked me to make this for her all the time and it's definitely a staple in our home. Our beef is tender, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a few pieces out so that we can start making our taquitos. Ooh. For those of you that are new to making birria, there's times when you get a piece of chuck that's just connected to some really tough tissue. So if that one doesn't get super soft on you, that's okay. I don't want you to feel that it's you. It's just the piece of beef that you have. So I try to pick pieces that don't have that much of a tissue there. So that way we can get the nice and tender fall apart beef. And now I'm going to inspire you to try your birria a little bit different. This that you're going to see right now, we call it birria asada. When you shred your beef, you don't want to pour any more sauce over it, but what you do want to do is add a little bit of oil to your pan or your skillet. Y vamos a asar la birria. We want it to get toasted on each side, so this should take you about six to eight minutes. You see those sear pieces we have on the beef? That's what we're talking about when we say birria asada. We're gonna start making the quesadillas, but at the end of this is gonna be a birria quesa taco. And a little bit of onions, a little bit of cilantro. And now we're just gonna serve you a little bit of consomme. To your consomme, you're gonna add a little bit of shredded cabbage. You're gonna take your quesadilla. And this is where you're gonna add your desired amount of your garlic chili oil. Now I'm gonna need somebody very special to say uh. Now while you're eating, you can dip into your consomme, fill your tummy with some delicious broth, and then take a bite. Or, and then take another bite. <laughs> Ay, que rico. I'm making a smothered creamy chipotle chicken. And in order to get the best flavor out of this recipe, you wanna use some fresh chicken broth. But if you don't have access to fresh chicken broth, that's okay. I'm gonna leave some suggestions for you in the description area so that you can make this recipe with us. You wanna start by seasoning your chicken with one teaspoon of ground cumin, paprika, onion powder, garlic powder, and Mexican oregano. And you wanna drizzle about two tablespoons of olive oil. Thank you, Claude. And a little extra one, okay. <laughs> it's beautiful. I don't mind it. Place your burner on a medium high heat and allow it to warm up. You're gonna drizzle a little bit of olive oil and you wanna soften up about two cups of mushrooms and two medium onions. Since we have our pan on a medium high, you're gonna notice that after four minutes, you might start burning your onions, so you wanna lower your temperature and give it a loving mix. And give or take after six to eight minutes, your onions are nice and soft, so you wanna go ahead and set them to the side. Next, you're gonna add a little bit of oil if you need it, and you're gonna start searing your chicken. Add 
soon as the chicken hits the pan, it's gonna transform the smell in your kitchen. And all you wanna do is cook it for about three minutes on each side. Once you've cooked your chicken, you're gonna add some butter, three minced garlic cloves, and then you're gonna add two cups of chicken broth. Start mixing and scraping so that we can get all those delicious bits into our broth. Next, you're gonna add two chipotles and about two tablespoons of the adobo sauce. Optional, but not necessary. I have a total of eight sun-dried tomatoes. Add one fourth of a cup of crema fresca and start combining your ingredients. Once you combine your ingredients, you're gonna add your onions and your mushrooms. And for those of you that don't like mushrooms, go ahead and skip them. Once you add your mushrooms and your onions, allow everything to come to temperature and to a boil. Once your pot comes to a boil, you're gonna start adding your pieces of chicken. These are my favorite days to film. <laughs> Is it? Smothered chicken, baby, I love it. Ooh, so good. <laughs> And just do your best to move them around if you end up slicing them the way that I did. Just want to make sure that they're all smothered and getting some of that delicious juice. Ooh, more juice. Thank you. Ooh, these onions are looking so beautiful. And since we don't want to lose too much of that broth, we're going to go ahead and place our burner on a medium-low heat. We're going to cook for about 13 to 15 minutes. Make sure to come and check out if everything's cooking properly, that you're not burning anything. But you want to put a little bit. And boom, done, our chicken is ready. I'm gonna take out a few of the pieces that I'm gonna save for tomorrow, but I don't think they're gonna make it till tomorrow. I think Cloud might be taking some for her work lunch, so. Te las dos Sorry, I'm mesmerized, I don't have that broth. Um, I was thinking more like dinner. <laughs> You're gonna have it twice. I will. <laughs> okay. It's kind of like, like tamales, you know, you can, don't get tired of them yeah. all day. Yeah, nice little way. protein bar. <laughs> yeah. So if you guys need some protein, these are delicious protein bars. I feel very blessed to be eating it for lunch and dinner. <laughs> it's so good. And lastly, you're going to add some fresh cilantro for flavor. And guess what? If you don't like cilantro, skip it. And right at the end, you're going to add a little bit of cracked pepper. And if you need a little bit of salt, go ahead and adjust to taste. And our family favorite, Mexican oregano and lemon or lime rice. Nice and fluffy because that's exactly how my family loves it. Now I'm gonna need somebody very special to say ah. Uh... And while you're enjoying that delicious bite, I do want to say be careful who you make this chicken for because they're going to end up falling in love with you. I think that's going to be so good. Oh, that is so good. Oh, that is so And now for the delicious part. That's for you. Dude, that used to drive me crazy. <laughs> I'm like, don't do it, Steph. <laughs> you knew I was gonna do it, cause it's delicious. I think everybody's a lot nicer to me when I have uh, the smothered chicken days, even the Views Club. <laughs> I can't possibly be nicer to you. You think I can? Mm. Okay, I'll take it on. Challenge well, accepted. No, I think I, you're perfect. No, I already know one situation. <laughs> I am not perfect. I know one situation where I mean, it can be better. I don't mind a box of chocolate. <laughs> I'll just say something similar. Yeah. Me piqué, me piqué con el pollo ahora. Double batch time. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I was gonna have ant logs for dinner, but this is. <laughs> You're so. I, I hate <laughs> the ant logs. You know that. <laughs> making a refreshing restaurant style horchata and you want to start by soaking two cups of long grain rice. You're also going to need six cups of water, five cloves, two cinnamon sticks, and now you're going to soak overnight or a minimum of eight hours for best flavor. 
Okay, it's been about eight hours and now we're just gonna add everything that we soaked into our blender. And now you wanna blend until smooth. And boom, done. And next you just wanna strain your ingredients. You can also use a cheesecloth for this part to get rid of all of the rice that you would get at the bottom. But I think that's what gives it a flavor. Whenever you go to a, a restaurant, you just gotta mix it and then pour. And you contain that cinnamon, the rice drink flavor. So it's gonna be up to you if you wanna strain it or not. You wanna save a little bit of your blended ingredients and you're gonna add a 12 ounce can of evaporated milk, a 14 ounce can of condensed milk, two tablespoons of vanilla, one fourth of a cup of sugar. And to balance out the sweetness, you just need a tiny little pinch of salt. And again, you wanna blend all your ingredients till everything's well combined. Okay, and then you're just gonna pour and strain until everything is nice and smooth. There's so many variations to this recipe. There's uh, recipes where you can add hot water uh, to soak your rice, but what ends up happening with that from what I've experienced is that you end up cooking your rice, and I like the flavor of soaked rice instead of cooked rice for my ochata. This recipe tastes best when you leave it in the refrigerator overnight to get nice and cold, or you can add a little bit of ice cubes. It's really gonna be up to you. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh. Tonight's dinner is calabacitas con queso. With just a few ingredients, you can get dinner done in 15 minutes. Let's start by sauteing half of an onion, two garlic cloves, and a little bit of oil. Continue to cook for three to four minutes or until your onions are nice and soft. Once your onions are nice and soft, you're gonna go ahead and remove them from your pan. Next, you're gonna cook two zucchinis and two cups of chicken broth. Once you achieve a boil, you're gonna go ahead and lower your temperature to a medium heat and you're gonna to continue to cook for about eight minutes. And while our zucchinis are cooking and getting nice and soft, I'm gonna start cooking our chicken. After eight minutes, you're gonna add your garlic and your onion, one cup of corn, two tablespoons of butter, one fourth of a cup of crema fresca, and if you don't have crema fresca, you can use some heavy whipping cream, one cup of queso chihuahua, you can also use mozzarella, and you want a salt and pepper to taste. Go ahead and place your temperature on a medium low heat, and give everything a loving mix. And after four minutes, we have some delicious calabacitas con queso. My kids can be picky at times, so I'm gonna give you guys a tip. If you like soft zucchinis, you can continue to cook them a little bit longer, but if the zucchinis have a little bit of a bite, my kids are more likely to enjoy them, so that's how I keep them for my family, but always remember to make it comfortable for your home. And if you feel like you want a little bit more cheese pull in here, you can always add a little bit more cheese on the top, but we're gonna keep it nice and simple today. And then I'm just gonna plate it with a little bit of the flat chicken that I taught you guys how to make last week and some black beans. Now who's ready for a delicious bite? Wow, ¿dónde saliste tú? And this is a Mexican household. We love queso fresco everywhere. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh... It's so good, Mom. You like it? You've come a long way to eat zucchinis. What would you, what would you say to someone that doesn't like zucchinis? It's a perfect recipe to eat it with. Okay. Well, that's a good tip. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> okay, babe. <laughs> Thank you for letting me feed you. My sweet boy. There's gonna be one day when you're not gonna want me to feed you, and I'm gonna be okay with that because you're letting me feed you now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I get to feed you some zucchinis y frijolitos. That makes your mamita so happy. Mm. <laughs> 
Today I'm making ground beef empanadas and in order to get the best flavor, you have to have a delicious dough. So don't get discouraged. I'm gonna show you the steps to get a perfect flaky dough to fill and fold your empanadas and your belly. Into your bowl, you wanna add four cups of all-purpose flour, one teaspoon of salt, and one fourth teaspoon of sugar. And then you're gonna incorporate half a cup of butter and half a cup of shortening into the flour until it's well combined. And I start off by pressing like this, making that butter even softer. And once you soften the butter into your flour, you wanna start giving it more of a squeeze to fully get all that butter and that fat into your flour. This should take you about four minutes and if you're wondering how do you know when it's well incorporated into your flour, I take a big pile and then I press it together, kind of like I'm smearing with my hand. And if it's smooth and you don't see any butter or shortening, then we're ready to continue to our next step. I have a cup of cold water and I'm going to start adding it gradually to our flour until everything is well combined. And once you start combining, you already can see how you're going to have a super flaky dough. Ooh, so delicious. Okay, I'm going to turn this over on my counter so that I can knead it properly. And combining your dough on your counter should take you about four minutes to get it nice and smooth and have it look just like this. Next, you wanna place your dough in the refrigerator for 20 to 30 minutes. While we allow our dough to rest in the refrigerator, we're gonna get started on our filling. So go ahead and place your pan on a medium heat and drizzle a little bit of oil. Next, we're gonna saute our onions. I'm using half of an onion and two green onions. Next, you're gonna add one and a half pounds of ground beef, one teaspoon of salt, and pepper to taste. Break down your ground beef and continue on a medium heat until everything is fully cooked. That should take you around four to six minutes. Once your ground beef is fully cooked, you're gonna add four ounces of diced green chili. I cut two medium potatoes into fourths into small little pieces like this. You're gonna go ahead and add that into your pot along with the one and a half cups of water that I've had my potatoes soaking in. Go ahead and give that a loving mix and you're gonna continue to cook for another 12 minutes on a medium heat or until your potatoes are nice and soft. And if you like cilantro, you wanna add a small bunch of cilantro. Give that a loving mix and now we're ready to start filling our empanadas. Okay, and now we're ready to start rolling out our dough. You're gonna dust your counter with a little bit of flour. Press down your dough. And start rolling. As you can see, it's a super easy and pliable dough to work with. You're not gonna have any problems at home making these empanadas. You can just lift it with your hand, dust your counter as needed so it doesn't stick too much, and continue to roll and thin out your dough. You want to use a round cookie cutter, but I'm a fan of using bowls usually, to be honest. It's really going to be up to you. Then you want to start cutting your dough. I'll dip it in my flour and then continue. So satisfying. Yeah, it is. So much fun to make. And then with this dough, you wanna knead it with your hands, just like this, combine it well. You're gonna wrap it up and place it in your refrigerator. And then when you're done making this set, you're gonna continue with the remaining ones. Dust your counter and your dough, and we're just gonna roll it out a little bit more. Don't overdo it because if you do, you're gonna have problems with your filling pouring out and even with your folding. You still want it to be a little thicker. Before you add your filling, you want to wet 
the edges of your dough. More of a half moon type of thing. This is going to help seal everything together. Then you're going to fill with about two to three tablespoons of your filling. And I know the potatoes look a little big, but they're nice and soft. And let me tell you, when you take a bite of these empanadas with that potato, it's memorable. And if you don't believe me, I encourage you to make them at home. So with my hands, kind of like a burrito, I like to help it. And I'm going to be tucking it in as I fold over. You want to align it together just like that. And you see with this hand, I'm still trying to keep all that filling in. Now this corner, you're going to bring it in to about right there. And you're going to press it. Now this part, you're going to fold it in. And I like to use this part of my thumbs, especially because I have nails. I know a lot of my ladies do too. You're going to press, bring it in with your nail. And you're just going to continue. The closer they are, the more cute little braids you get. Fold and press, fold and press. And this is why when you're rolling it out, you don't want to stretch it because you want to have enough dough here to fold and press. And right when you start, you're going to think nothing's happening. But right at the end, you're going to see that it does. This little edge, nobody ever knows what to do with it, so just give it another fold and just let it be. I'm gonna give you the best tip to folding perfect empanadas. It's gonna be best that you fill your empanada, seal it, set it to the side until you're done with all of them. Don't come and fold them because it's just gonna end up a little bit too soft. Once they've been setting there for at least five minutes, it's gonna be easier for you to start folding them. In this bowl, I have one egg with half a tablespoon of water and you just want to mix it really well and then you're going to caress your empanadas with it. Make sure to coat it well so that it's nice and shiny when it comes out of the oven. Go ahead and place your empanadas in a preheated oven at 425 degrees for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, you're going to lower your temperature to 350 degrees and you're going to continue to bake for 30 to 35 minutes. And there you have it, a beautiful and delicious empanada, perfect for you and your loved ones. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh, Today I'm making polvorones de chocolate, an easy chocolate shortbread cookie recipe. Let's start by sifting our dry ingredients. You're gonna need one cup of all-purpose flour, two tablespoons of powdered sugar, one and a half tablespoons of cocoa powder, and start sifting. Once you sift your ingredients, you're gonna add a pinch of salt, and you're gonna give everything a loving mix. Next, you're gonna add one stick of butter. I'm one of those people that likes their baked goods, salty and sweet. Ooh, just perfect. Same. We're twinning. Yes. And then you want to start incorporating your butter into your flour. So you're just going to pinch like this. Just really cute. Continue combining your ingredients until everything's nice and smooth and then you can start making your little balls. I'm going to use one tablespoon to measure our cookies, but you can just pinch and eyeball it. It's going to be up to you, but if you want more of a perfect look, it's best that you measure them. I find that it's easier to form them if you squeeze your hands with your dough just a little bit. You're going to start rolling it and making a smooth ball. And once you have a nice round ball, you can start placing it on your baking sheet and continue with the remaining cookies. This recipe yields for 12 to 14 cookies, and now you're gonna bake in your preheated oven at 350 degrees for 25 minutes. And once your cookies come out of the oven, you wanna allow them to rest for 10 minutes before we start coating them. And while they cool in a separate bowl, I'm gonna add about a cup of powdered sugar. And I do wanna share that these are the kind of cookies that I like to put in my kids' Easter baskets. And yeah, no matter how old they are, I'll always put cookies in their Easter basket. 
um, and I like these. You can order these online. I'll have Cloud link it in the description. And if you don't want to go out your way and purchase something extra, it's okay. You can use some of your little sandwich bags um, like this to place them in there. You can just tie it like this and then you're set. Go ahead and take your beautiful cookie and just put it into some powdered sugar. You know, every time it snows uh, where I'm at, I always make something super special for the kids and it just makes it a really fun experience. So these are perfect for the occasion. It makes me feel like I'm in a magical place making cookies, you know? You're so sweet. I am, I'm in a magical place right now. You are a magical sister. What? Perfect cookies for my <laughs> sister. <laughs> I know guys, we get really corny about how much we love each other. <laughs> But just so you know, we get corny like that about you guys too. <laughs> we do. <laughs> so for those of you that are silent viewers, I know that you're shy, but every so often you might want to come out and say hello so we can get corny about you guys too. <laughs> so if you're going to be eating these now, um, you only have to coat them one time, but if you're going to use these to make as a little gift bag um, or for later consumption, you definitely want to coat them twice, okay? And I'll show you how to do that in just a moment because these are going to be going into a little treat bag. For those of you that have uh, children that go to school, school can be really stressful. It doesn't matter if you're in uh, preschool or high school. So if you have some of these little treats for the kids in the car on their way home, it's really going to make their day. Hey, what about our college kids? College kids? Mm, I, I'd have a different treat for you. You guys need a bigger <laughs> meal than just your little cookies. A bigger snack? A bigger <laughs> snack. The cookies have been here for about three minutes and that's when you can start all over from the beginning and coat them one more time. You can dust them off like this too. See how it's still warm? Perfect. We need a thick coating there. <laughs> What did you think? You weren't going to get a bite? Of course you are. I'm going to need somebody very special to say, uh... For those of you that are on a diet, you only get one in here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> not me. It's definitely not me. Ooh, yes. Okay, and this one, you're going to be able to fit two. And boom, done. I want to inspire you to make some quesadillas for dinner, and since my sister brought me a big bulk size Costco mushroom carton, uh, we're going to be using that, so you're going to need about two cups. And with onions, you can use as much as you want. I'm using half of a large onion. And this part here should take you six to eight minutes. And I do make this recipe often when I'm short on time. So whenever I saute a lot of mushrooms and onions, I tend to freeze them for an easy dinner. Once you see your onions are a little bit softer, you can start seasoning with a little bit of salt and some pepper. Once you season your onions and your mushrooms and you see that they're nice and soft, you can add one cup of corn and you're going to continue to cook for another two minutes. For my other salad quesadilla that I like, I'll show you how to make that. You're gonna add some butter, jalapeño, a little oil so our butter doesn't burn. And I slice some queso fresco and we're just gonna sear it. Add some black pepper and salt to taste. You wanna sear your queso fresco two minutes on each side. And when it looks like this, you're ready to turn off your burner. So you're just going to add your tortilla, your cheese, 
and allow it to melt. Be very careful when you're opening it up. You're gonna add your queso fresco and your jalapeño. And of course you can add a little bit of hot sauce. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say uh, quesadillas with a little snack to munch on and I've been having this snack since I was uh, a teenager. So all it is is cucumbers and carrots. You're gonna add some black pepper. Salt to taste. And some lime juice. What a perfect way to get cloud to eat her carrots. Thank you, sister. You're welcome. I think I made these on the channel maybe, what, five years ago? It's been that long already? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so good. They're crunchy. Mm. Ooh, the pepper with the lemon. Thank you. Most of these carrots are for you, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> little fruit roll ups. You get it. You get it. <laughs> little veg, veg roll-ups. <laughs> And you have to remember, sometimes, you do have to eat fresh. After your quesadilla, of course. Today I'm making Mexican street corn macaroni pasta salad. And in order to maximize the flavor, you want to boil your corn in a pot of hot water. And what I like to do is I like to mix one tablespoon of maseca, which is instant corn masa, with a little bit of water. And I pour it right into the pot with half a cup of milk, one teaspoon of salt, five corn on the cob, and you want to boil your corn for about 15 minutes on a medium heat. In the meantime, I'm going to roast two cups of corn with a little bit of butter. In the same water that you use to boil your corn, you're going to add one and a half pounds of macaroni pasta, and you're going to continue to cook as suggested on your package. And then you just want to start cutting your corn kernels. You're gonna go ahead and add one and a half cups of mayonnaise, two cups of crema fresca, two cups of cotija, four tablespoons of hot sauce, a little sprinkle of tajin, don't go too heavy. You're gonna add one cup of your roasted corn, Once you're done combining your ingredients, if you need a little bit more of a bite, uh, you can add a shredded rotisserie chicken, a small bunch of cilantro, and you're gonna give it another loving mix. Go ahead and taste your pasta, and if you need a little bit of salt, go ahead and sprinkle a little bit of salt, a little bit of cracked pepper, and we're ready to serve. Excuse the children, it's spring break. <laughs> They're all having a really, really good time. I love to hear the kids playing, screaming, singing. Yes. You know? Asking for snacks. <laughs> yeah. You know, there was a Santana song where he said, uh, let the children play. Ellos tienen que jugar. Oh, it's, it's true. Tienen que jugar los niños. Then you can garnish with a little bit of cotija, the remaining roasted corn, cilantro, and boom, done. You're ready to serve. You also want to keep some hot Cheetos in a container next to your pasta salad that we can just sprinkle a little bit over the top. Now I'm going to need somebody very special to say, uh... It's Taco Tuesday and I want to inspire you to make an easy dinner and it doesn't get tastier than a Mexican style breaded fish. It's absolutely delicious and you can easily make it into a taco. Let's start by seasoning our fish. I'm gonna season our fish with one tablespoon of white pepper, salt, garlic powder, one teaspoon of paprika, and one teaspoon of parsley. Make sure you're seasoning both sides of the fish. And today I'm working with tilapia, 
And I have one person in my family that doesn't want tilapia today, so I have a little piece of salmon. To my first tray, I'm gonna add one cup of all-purpose flour and the remaining seasoning. And mix until your ingredients are fully combined. To the next tray, I'm gonna add pan molido, which is Mexican breadcrumbs. And in this bowl, I have a mixture of half a cup of milk and two eggs. And you wanna beat them until they're fully combined. That way we can get started on our dipping. Take your piece of fish and you're gonna dip it into your flour mixture. Then you're gonna tap off the excess flour. And then you're gonna set it to the side. We're setting up for success today. Next, you're gonna dip your fish in egg wash. And then into your breadcrumbs. And boom, done. You want to continue with the remaining pieces of fish. And I will say, once you get to this part, try to only use one hand to dip into the egg and into your breadcrumbs because then you're going to get some really crusty fingers and it gets interesting. With an uncoated wooden spoon, wooden chopstick, or some toothpicks, you can place them into your oil. And once you get a vigorous bubble, that means that you're ready to fry. Place your fish in the oil and push it out that way. And after a minute, minute and a half, your fish will be ready to take out of that oil and you can continue with the remaining one. Before I serve a delicious plate for you, let me show you how I prepare this delicious rice that pairs so beautifully with this dish. I place my Instant Pot on saute for about five minutes and I'm gonna add one teaspoon of oil. I'm gonna add two cups of long grain rice, one fourth of an onion, and two garlic cloves. Give that a loving mix and allow it to cook for about two to three minutes. Next, you're gonna add one carrot, one celery stalk, half a cup of corn, one roasted poblano pepper, one teaspoon of salt, and two cups of water. Give that a loving mix, put a lid on it, and press on your rice button. Allow for a slow pressure release. And who doesn't love a beautiful and fluffy rice? I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh, and I like to have my seafood with a little bit of spice, and if I'm gonna recommend one, it's gonna be Mexico Lindo Salsa Siete Mares. Mmm. That's so good. I'm so impressed by my own hand right now. <laughs> Mmm, I know somebody can't have seafood out there, so I'm gonna give you a little taste of rice. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> it's Monday and I wanna inspire you to cook a quick and affordable meal and it doesn't get easier than in tomatadas. Now let's get started by roasting six tomatoes, two garlic cloves, one fourth of an onion, one jalapeño or your choice of spice. Once your ingredients have roasted beautifully, you're gonna add them to your blender. Add one teaspoon of chicken bouillon and half a cup of water. And now you want to blend until smooth. And boom, done. Place your burner on a medium heat and you're going to add about one teaspoon of oil. Today I am using grapeseed oil because my sister cares about my health and my cholesterol. So you're going to see a lot of changes on the channel. Add your blended ingredients. And give that a loving mix. And hang on tight because we just want this to come to a boil. Once you reach a boil, you're gonna go ahead and lower your temperature. And in the meantime, we've been warming up our oil and we're gonna start dipping our tortillas. And you only have to fry them about five seconds on each side. And this is a perfect recipe for those of you that can't have too much spice because you can decide to add a serrano or a pepper or you can just skip. 
And to your queso fresco, you want to add a pinch of Mexican oregano. Because if you add that to the sauce, it's going to taste like uh, spaghetti sauce and you don't want that. So you just need to add a little bit to your cheese. And dip your tortilla in that beautiful and delicious sauce. And quickly roll it up. Then you're going to drizzle your crema fresca over the top. And then you're going to sprinkle some more queso fresco over the top. If you have hearty eaters that require a little bit more substance to get full, I'm going to show you what I like to do. Now I'm going to need somebody very special to say, uh, to dip it into the frijoles y para adentro. Mmm. That's beautiful. Tastes good, looks good, and super easy to make. Mmm. -hmm. Hello and welcome back. Today we're making a refreshing seafood boil verde. Let's start by bringing four liters of water to a boil. Once your pot comes to a boil, you're gonna add two Anaheim peppers, two celery stalks, two green onions, half a white onion, three tablespoons of mustard, two bay leaves, two tablespoons of white vinegar, two tablespoons of soy sauce, one tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce, half a tablespoon of white pepper, one tablespoon of garlic powder, one tablespoon of onion powder, one tablespoon of sugar, and one tablespoon of chicken bouillon. Give that a loving mix and bring your temperature to a medium heat. Then you're gonna add one pound of petite gold potatoes and your desired amount of corn. And you wanna make sure to continue boiling until your potatoes are nice and soft. And now it's time to make our delicious dipping sauce. You're gonna need three cups of chicken broth, one tablespoon of ginger paste, or you can use fresh ginger, or you can even use your sushi ginger. Four tomatillos, two jalapeños, and if you love spice, you can add an extra serrano, a handful of cilantro, and one cucumber. And now you wanna blend until smooth. And boom, almost done. Place your burner on a medium heat and add two sticks of butter. Add a little bit of olive oil, that way your butter doesn't burn. Next, you're gonna add four minced garlics and half of a white onion. Continue cooking on a medium low until your onions are nice and soft. Once your onions are nice and soft, you're gonna go ahead and add your blended ingredients. Give that a loving mix and continue cooking until you come to a boil. Once your pot comes to a boil, you're gonna add half a tablespoon of white pepper, one tablespoon of Mexican oregano, and you're gonna squeeze the juice of one lemon. Continue cooking on a medium-low heat for five to six minutes. Give that a loving mix, and then you wanna taste your sauce and adjust your salt to taste. Or you can enhance the flavor by using chicken bouillon, but I'll tell you that this vegetable broth mix is absolutely delicious with this flavor combination that we have going on, and you're gonna to wanna to use one tablespoon. Our potatoes are nice and soft. I'm just gonna remove our corn. That way we have enough space to pour in our shrimp and our snow crab. Put a lid on it and continue to boil on a high heat for two to three minutes. And boom, done. Let's start assembling our seafood boil. And for those of you that love to dip as much as I do, make sure to set a lot of your sauce aside. That way you can give some to your family and you guys can all keep dipping. Before we add our sauce, you wanna add your pre-cooked Mexican longaniza, which is a Mexican sausage. I've cut some cucumbers into spears. And you guys know Mexican people with seafood and cucumbers, you know, that makes us happy. Or at least me, let me know. Let me know in the comments. <laughs> you wanna sprinkle some Mexican pickled onions. And don't be shy because once you start biting into the sauce and these pickled onions, I'm gonna tell you, it's just a game changer. <laughs> I can't even speak, this is gonna be so good. You want to add your lemons because you're going to need a lot of that. I'm 
I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh, look away because this is about to get dangerous. This is my weekend Mexican coffee because as most of you know, I'm a huge Formula One fan. My whole family is. So this is a brunchy kind of treat in the morning while I'm watching the race. Place your burner on a medium heat and you're gonna add two cups of milk and one cinnamon stick. You're gonna allow this to come to a boil, so don't leave the area. Once your pot comes to a boil, you're gonna place your burner on a low heat. You're gonna add half a cup of sugar, half a tablespoon of imitation rum flavor, one teaspoon of vanilla, a dash of ground nutmeg, and a pinch of salt. Give your beautiful ingredients a loving mix and continue to cook for another minute. You just wanna make sure that your sugar has dissolved nicely into our milk. Once your ingredients are fully combined, you're gonna go ahead and strain them. You can use a bowl or a pot, and I put a little bit of ice in there, just to cool it slightly. We don't want it to freeze, just a little cool. You're gonna need a total of three egg yolks. Once you separate your egg yolks, you're gonna start mixing them for a good 30 seconds. Do it quickly. This is gonna warm up our egg yolks just a little bit. If you were to pour all of our warm milk into your egg yolks, you're gonna create something really gross. So you're just gonna add a few drops and you're gonna keep mixing. And I'm gonna start with half a cup. And this is just bringing our egg yolks to the same temperature. Woohoo! we did it. See, it's smooth with no lumps. So just take your time. It's better to take it slowly when you're adding your milk than to just rush through it. Place your burner on a medium heat and bring your pot up to a boil. Once your pot comes to a boil, you're gonna lower your temperature to a medium low heat and you're gonna to continue to stir for the next five minutes. Go ahead and turn your burner off. Our rompope is ready. This is about the thickness that you're looking for. And you can just transfer your rompope into a glass container. You're going to allow this to cool before you transfer it to the refrigerator and it will last you max two and a half to three days. I showed you guys last month how to make my Cafe de Olla Express and I'll link that in the description area and that's the coffee blend that I'm using today. And boom done who's ready for a taste because I have some for everybody oh yeah <laughs> I'm gonna need somebody very special to say uh thank you sister you're welcome friends if you need something comforting in a cup this is gonna be a winner especially if you have elders Mexican elders if you make this for them it's just gonna make them feel like they were young and they're gonna help you sweep the kitchen <laughs> oh I'm definitely helping you sweep the kitchen this is so good Oh, look away because I'm going to get hyper in a second. <laughs> this is cafecito time with your comadre or your compadres. This is perfect. Yeah, for those of you that play Loteria or you have a celebration, if you make this combination for your family, they're going to ask you how you made it and you're going to shine. You're going to be a superstar. <laughs> well, you already are, but you know what I mean. This is so good, girl. This is my weekend Mexican coffee because as most of you know, I'm a huge Formula One fan, my whole family is. So this is a brunchy kind of treat in the morning while I'm watching the race, because I get up extra early and it just hits the spot, you know? Or you can have it iced. How would you have it on ice, Cobb? Just let this cool down and then just add pour it to my ice. Exactly, that's how easy it's gonna be for you to make this on ice. Mm. Yeah, te picaste, te picaste. <laughs> Me la lengua. <laughs> mm. Whoa. Salud. Cheers. Like if it doesn't make enough noise, I'm like, pop. <laughs> I'm a walking sound effect. Meow. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. Today I'll be showing you how to make the best refried beans using some best practices with our Instant Pot.
Let's start by adding two cups of beans into our Instant Pot, six cups of water, one fourth of an onion, two garlic cloves, and half a tablespoon of salt. Go ahead and pressure cook your beans for 45 minutes. After 45 minutes of cooking in your pressure cooker, you can choose to do a slow release or a quick release, but you're gonna find that your beans are missing a little bit of that traditional Mexican flavor that we like. You can see that the liquid in here is still runny and we need it a little bit thicker. You're gonna go ahead and cancel everything on your pressure cooker and you're gonna continue to slow cook for two hours. And you're gonna notice a huge difference, not just in flavor, but in the look that you wanna achieve when making your Mexican refried beans. Now for your refried beans, you wanna place your burner on a medium heat and add some lard. Once your lard gets nice and hot, you're gonna add half of an onion and your choice of a serrano or a jalapeno. Continue to cook until your onions are translucent and make sure not to burn any of the ingredients in this step. Once your onions get nice and soft, you're going to start adding your whole pinto beans. And you want to add some of the liquid, that way it's easier for you to start mashing your beans. And you just want to keep mashing until you achieve your desired consistency. In all honesty, you can keep your beans like this and eat them and serve and they're gonna be perfectly fine, but if you want the authentic style of refried beans, let me show you how to achieve that. I currently have my burner on a medium heat and we just wanna make sure to dry out our beans a little bit more uh, to make them refried beans. And I'm gonna show you what you need to do for that. In this pot, I have one fourth of a cup of warm lard and you wanna make sure to keep it hot. I've been mixing and stirring for a good four minutes, and now we're gonna go ahead and add our melted lard. So all you want to do is continue to mix until the lard is well combined into your beans. And there you have it, the most beautiful and delicious refried beans you're ever going to make. Today I'm going to show you how to make an amazing family style chicken dinner. Let's start by seasoning our chicken with half a tablespoon of ground cumin, half a tablespoon of Mexican oregano, half a tablespoon of chicken bouillon one heaping teaspoon of black pepper, and two minced garlic cloves. Fully combine all your ingredients and then you're gonna add two tablespoons of olive oil. Once you fully season your chicken, you wanna set this to the side for five to 10 minutes. Set your burner on a medium heat and once your pan is nice and hot, you're gonna add your chicken. Flip your chicken and continue searing for another four minutes. Go ahead and remove the chicken from the pan. And next you're gonna add your poblano, two chopped tomatoes, and one medium onion. Whoa, that smells so good. Continue to saute and scrape the bits off until your tomatoes are nice and soft. Once your tomatoes are nice and soft, just like that, you're gonna add eight ounces of tomato sauce. Give that a loving mix and continue cooking your tomato sauce with your ingredients for a good 30 to 45 seconds. 
And for those of you watching right now, if you don't have chicken at home or any kind of beef, that's okay. You can add some potatoes, some zucchinis, or even your carrots. Serve this over rice and you're set. Add two cups of water. Combine all your ingredients and allow that to come to a boil. Once your ingredients come to a boil, you're gonna start adding your chicken breast. And if you have to patch up your chicken, that's okay. Just put that little piece back over here. <laughs> it should be okay. Where'd your tortilla glue when you need it? You need some tortilla glue? <laughs> this is the time. Continue cooking on a medium heat for about 20 minutes. Make sure that you come periodically, move your chicken around, make sure that nothing's sticking or burning. Your last five minutes of cooking time, you're gonna place your burner on a medium low heat and you're gonna cover it with the lid. And there you have it, a beautiful and delicious chicken breast. For garnish and flavor, you wanna add a little bit of cilantro and some purple onions. And boom, done, who's ready for a taste? Hello and welcome back. Today we're making juicy chicken cooked in its own broth. And we're gonna start seasoning our chicken with one teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of ground cumin, and half a tablespoon of black pepper. Four minced garlic cloves. Once you fully combine your chicken, you're gonna go ahead and set it to the side and we're gonna start by blending our sauce. To your blender, you wanna add 10 tomatillos, one onion, a handful of cilantro, one cup of water, and now you wanna blend until smooth. And boom, done. Place your burner on a medium high heat and once your pan gets nice and hot, you're gonna add eight to 10 pieces of bacon. You know what I say, when you have hungry teenagers, you might wanna add a little bit more bacon. We're gonna continue cooking for another six minutes until our bacon gets nice and cooked. Once your bacon is nice and crispy like cloud, you wanna go ahead and remove it. I am feeling this. very crispy today. It's crispy <laughs> today. I mean, as soon as you start taking the ba the bacon out, you're gonna want to eat it. Oh, oh, girl, are you okay? Oh. That's the second time we screamed this week. All those splashes. <laughs> oh, careful! It came for me because I wanted to eat it. Be careful. You know your bacon talks back. We were cooking light, and the water talked back. Remember? It did. <laughs> To be honest, this is way too much bacon for our recipe. We're only gonna need about two tablespoons, so I'm gonna go ahead and carefully pour it into another little bowl. Next, you're gonna add your jalapenos and your green onions. Next, you're gonna add your chicken. Continue cooking on a medium heat and allow your chicken to sear for three minutes. Next, you're gonna add your onions, bacon, and your chili. The green parts of your onion. Your blended ingredients one cup of beans and one cup of your bean broth. Go ahead and give that a loving mix. Make sure all your ingredients are fully combined. This is an absolutely beautiful dish, right? <laughs> Look how gorgeous it looks. Once you fully combine all your ingredients, you're gonna to continue to cook for 13 to 15 minutes. Once everything is perfectly cooked, you're gonna go ahead and turn your burner off and I'm gonna add some extra cilantro on the top because we love it and it looks beautiful when you're serving. And boom, done. I didn't get distracted. We have our jugo. All that delicious juice is right here. <laughs> and that's exactly how you wanna make any kind of recipe that says chicken or carne en su jugo, a nice delicious broth. Now I'm gonna need somebody very special to say uh. Mm. 
That is absolutely delicious. Hello and welcome back. We hope that you're having a lovely holiday season and today we're going to be making my famous flan. We've received a lot of comments about how my flan recipe is the best you've ever had and now we're going to supersize it so you can impress your family. Let's start making our caramel by placing our pan on a medium heat and allowing it to warm up for a good minute. Add one and a half cups of sugar. Smooth it out and if any of the little clumps of sugar are in here just break them down. When you see puddles that are melted, that's where I'll go and start tapping in the sugar. There are certain parts of your burner that burn a lot hotter, so you can also move your pan a little bit. Are you gonna tell us not to walk away and be careful with the burning sugar? You got it, Cloud. Do not walk away. Be careful with the sugar. It's really hot. This can um, burn through your skin. It can be really dangerous, so make sure that you're responsible while you're doing this. <laughs> We've been making flan for many years, and we always remind each other of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you never know. When I get really, really old, I'm going to need somebody to remind me. So if you're still watching me when I get to that age, you need to remind me, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Beast Club Junior. Yes. Right when you see all your sugar melts, your caramel should be really, really hot, so you can go ahead and turn your burner off. Our family personally likes the dark caramel, but if you like it a little bit lighter, I definitely suggest that you melt it at a lower temperature and you're gonna get more of a lighter color. And all I'm doing is mixing just slightly to make sure that every part of the sugar is completely melted into a delicious caramel. Today I'm gonna be using a roasting pan and a four quart bunt pan. So I've shown you before, you can use some other uh, flan molds or just a round one and it works out perfectly. Be very careful when you're pouring. I want you to burn yourself. No se me quemen. And I hope to hear the gentlemen in the comments they are going to make this for their lady love. Once you pour it in, just give it a little bit of a whirl to make sure that it gets nice and coated at the bottom. And now we're going to make our custard. You're going to need 10 eggs, so I suggest that you crack them into a different bowl. That way you avoid having any of the eggshells because that's just going to be really gross. You don't want to do that. To your blender, you're going to add two 12-ounce cans of evaporated milk, two 14-ounce cans of condensed milk. Make sure to get all of it into the blender. You don't want to leave any of your condensed milk behind. Four tablespoons of vanilla, and I'm using the Mexican vanilla blend. It's going to add so much flavor to your flan, you're not going to regret it. You'll need four cups of heavy whipping cream, but if you find a quart or 32 ounces, just pour it all right in. I'm using a blender that can handle 64 ounces, and as you can see, I'm always pushing it in the kitchen. So I'm just gonna pour a little bit into the eggs and we're gonna mix in two different batches. Since we're working with a large quantity, I'm gonna use a pot to strain all my ingredients in, so I'll just have this right here to the side ready for me to just pour it in. And all we did was blend for a good 30 seconds. And I left a little bit of our cream blend in there so it can blend well with our eggs. Give that a loving mix to make sure that all our ingredients are well combined since we blended it in two batches.
And now I'm just gonna cover our flan with some foil. You're gonna pour enough water to reach to the middle part of your flan baking pan. And for reference, you can see the pans all the way up here and our water is just right there. Now you're gonna place your flan in a preheated oven at 350 degrees for two and a half hours. And after two and a half hours, you should have a beautiful flan that gives you a stiff jiggle. You see that? That's what you're looking for. So while our flan is hot, I'm gonna go ahead and run a knife all through the edge right here. After you run the knife through it, just at the top right here, if you get any of these right here, you wanna take them off. It's not that serious to be honest when you serve it, but just to be, you know, extra, we're gonna take them off. And all that really is is that foam on the top. Usually I use a cheesecloth when I'm straining, but I was moving quickly today. It's not a deal breaker. It's gonna be equally as delicious. Next, you're gonna allow your flan to cool for 30 to 45 minutes. And then after, you're gonna place a foil over the top and you're gonna place it in your refrigerator for a minimum of eight hours or until it gets nice and cold for you, which is usually overnight for us. The flan has been in the refrigerator overnight and it's nice and cold and ready for us to flip. Now that our flan is nice and cold, I'm just gonna run a knife all through the side. Ooh. It's gonna be juicy. Now, whoever wants a taste, I'm gonna need you to say ah. Uh... And for those of you that don't wanna supersize your flan today, that's okay. I'm gonna go ahead and leave the original recipe in the description area for you. Mmm. Hello and welcome. Today I'm gonna show you how to make my famous rotisserie chicken macaroni pasta salad. If you love deli style salad, you're gonna love this one. Anytime that I make this for any friend or family member, they ask me how I made it. And honestly, this is a recipe you wanna keep in your refrigerator if you have hungry kids. It's super easy. All you need is some rotisserie chicken, some macaroni, and you definitely don't wanna skip on using some Dijon mustard. For those of you that bought this, it's in the back of your refrigerator right now, go ahead and pull it out because this salad is gonna transform your life. And honestly, those nights when you don't feel like making dinner, you just serve this salad with some Ritz crackers and I'm telling you, your kids are not gonna complain. And my kids are big eaters. You guys have seen them eat, you've seen us eat. Now let's get started with this recipe. To a pot of salty water, you wanna add your pasta. And today I'm using one pound of Dechecco elbow pasta. It says to cook for five minutes, but I'm gonna cook it an extra three minutes because I want my noodles to be nice and soft. You're gonna need three and a half cups of mayonnaise. One fourth of a cup of Dijon mustard. You're gonna need one teaspoon of thyme. If you have fresh thyme, this tastes even better, but if you don't, you can use some dry thyme and make sure to grind it up. Half a teaspoon of white pepper. If you don't have white pepper, that's okay. You can use some black pepper. And this one just gives you more of a subtle spicy kick. 
And if you really want to impress this holiday season, I definitely suggest you get some Kinder Garlic and Herb Seasoning. It's the best combination with this particular salad. But if you don't have this one, any kind of Kinder Seasoning will work. You're going to need one teaspoon. And if you're using Kinder Seasoning, you're going to find that it's salted to perfection. So you don't have to worry about that. One green onion. If you want to preserve this for longer than seven days, I definitely suggest to add one teaspoon of apple cider vinegar. Other than that, you are set to go, but it won't last seven days in your refrigerator. Max, maybe two days. You see that juice in the bottom? We're gonna need it. What you wanna do is remove the skin and you wanna save that for the person that is helping you get the best angles. And you want them to take a bite. Oh, thank you. Sometimes when you keep your rotisserie chicken out, you get a more gelatinous uh, consistency of your broth. That's okay. Go ahead and add and mix it to the sauce, and you're not going to regret it. It's a lot of flavor. Just keep on mixing, keep on mixing. If you're going to be serving this the next day or maybe in three days and you're making it in advance, you want to save half a cup of your dressing and that's when you're going to add the day of because it's going to be nice and cold and keep it super creamy. Because any kind of pasta salad you make after a period of time, it just loses its luster, but we're going to help it out. Most of the time when you're going to shred your chicken, you end up with thick long strips like this. For this salad, I definitely suggest you just pinch and have little bits like this. Promise you it makes a difference in this salad. For this particular recipe, you wanna just use the chicken breast. It's nice and white and it's gonna keep your pasta salad looking beautiful. So that's a lot of chicken. This is a filling recipe. And one of the things you don't wanna to forget to do is you don't wanna to forget to try your chicken and your sauce. And remember to save your little carcass to make some delicious chicken broth. Oh, you'll have to forgive me, I couldn't resist. Mm. Add your pasta to your sauce. I know some of you are already looking at me, Steph, you're going to need a bigger bowl. We're going to do just fine today. <laughs> just make sure to give that a good, good mix. We want our pasta to be beautifully coated with our dressing. Once everything's combined, you're going to go ahead and add your chicken. If you have a small bowl, it's gonna take you some time to mix it, but let me tell you, it's gonna be worth it. You can taste your pasta salad right now, but I definitely suggest you place this in the refrigerator for a minimum of three hours for best flavor. And for those of you who wanna taste, I'm gonna need somebody very special to say, uh, Hello and welcome back. If you're looking to change up your chicken dinner, I have a winner. Oregano chicken and potatoes is best when you're using fresh oregano, but if you don't have access to fresh oregano, it's okay to use your dry oregano for this recipe. Let's start by removing the oregano leaves from the stem. And don't forget to engage with your food. When you're using fresh ingredients, you just wanna smell and connect with the food. And I'm telling you, once you eat this piece of chicken, your life is never gonna be the same. Your family's gonna be asking you to make it again and again, and guess what? It's super easy to make, so you can relax. Oregano is my favorite herb, and for those of you that are gonna be using dried oregano, you're gonna to wanna to use two tablespoons. I'm gonna mix this with one tablespoon dry with about eight fresh stems of oregano. As I mentioned, I have fresh oregano, and I'm gonna add one tablespoon of dried. Four large garlic cloves, two teaspoons of smoked paprika, two teaspoons of salt, one fourth of a cup of olive oil, and now you wanna blend until you've developed a nice paste. And boom, done. 
I have a pound and a half of chicken breast, but this recipe is good for up to two pounds. Pour your blended ingredients. And you just wanna make sure to coat every single piece of chicken. This chicken tastes great if you marinate overnight, but if you're a busy person like myself, you can let this rest for about 15 minutes and it should bring in so much flavor that your family's not gonna notice a difference. Perfect, I'm gonna cover our chicken and let this rest for 15 minutes. Today I'm cooking with a cast iron and I placed it on a high heat and as soon as you see the smoke coming out, you wanna go ahead and start placing your pieces of chicken right on in. Once you place your chicken on your pan, you wanna lower your temperature to a medium to a medium high heat and you're gonna to continue to cook for six minutes without moving anything. Once you flip your pieces of chicken, you're gonna to continue to cook for another four minutes. I slice four potatoes into half moons and you just wanna add them right over your chicken. After you add your delicious potatoes, you're gonna add one and a half cups of water to your pan. Continue to cook for another 30 minutes on a medium heat or until your potatoes are nice and soft. And boom, done. Our delicious oregano chicken is ready. Last but not least, you want to squeeze a little bit of lemon juice over the top. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say ah. Uh... And there you have it, a super easy chicken dinner. And this is a perfect dinner to make for your family for those days where you see your family's a little bit stressed or they're exhausted. Because when you're cooking with oregano, it tends to relax your body. So if this is not a winner winner chicken dinner, I don't know what is. Hello and welcome back. My family's been craving enchiladas and today I'm gonna to show you a quick and easy way to make them. And we're gonna start by making our enchilada sauce from scratch. You wanna start by removing the stem and the seeds from your chiles guajillos. If your chiles are small, you wanna use 10 and if they're a little bit larger, then you wanna use eight. Since mine are a little bit small today, we're gonna to go with 10. And all you have to do is soak your chiles for 10 minutes until they're nice and soft. Once your chiles are nice and soft, you're gonna place them right into your blender. And you're gonna add three cups of your chili water. Add two garlic cloves. And for spice, you can use chile de arbol or some chiltepines. One teaspoon of salt, and remember to adjust to taste. And now you wanna blend until smooth. And boom, done, let's strain it. Place your burner on a medium heat and drizzle half a tablespoon of a neutral oil. Next, you're gonna start straining your chili right into your pan. And if you use a metal whisk, it's gonna make this process a lot easier. Sprinkle one teaspoon of Mexican oregano, and if you don't have it, you can go ahead and skip it. Give that a loving mix and you're going to continue to cook for another 8 to 10 minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to slide this to the back and we're going to get started on frying our tortillas. Now you're going to place your corn tortilla into the hot oil and you're going to fry for about 10 to 15 seconds. And if for some reason you have some tortillas that fall apart, don't stress it. You can fry it up a little bit longer. That way it doesn't tear too much for you, but if, even if it tears, it's not that big of a deal for this style of enchilada. Our enchilada sauce is ready thickened up you can see that the color has changed 
Now you want to place your burner on a low. That way when we dip our tortillas, it's hot enough to melt the cheese. Add some of your sauce to the bottom. Take your tortilla and dip it into that delicious sauce. Nice and smothered. You want to add some shredded melty white cheese. You can use mozzarella or traditionally this is made with chihuahua or menonita cheese. If your family needs a little bit of protein, you can add some shredded chicken, onions, and then you want to start stacking your next layer. And you want to continue stacking them up until your little heart desires. Some people only need two, some of you need three or four, and that's okay. These enchiladas are perfect to make, especially for those tortillas that have no hope. And for your last layer, you just want to add a little bit more sauce. To the top, you're going to add some cotija cheese. If you like Mexican crema, you can drizzle a little bit of that over the top as well. Garnish with a little bit of cilantro, or you can use some green onions. And to keep this recipe traditional, you have to fry an egg and place it over the top. And that's perfect if you have hearty eaters. Now who's ready for a bite? What's better than a stack of pancakes? A stack of enchiladas. I'm gonna need somebody very special. Oops, somebody wanted that piece that belonged to you to say uh and there you have it quick and easy enchiladas if you're looking for these enchiladas at a mexican restaurant you would ask for enchiladas montadas these are from chihuahua mexico and i hope you love them as much as i do mm. oh that was good you surprise yourself every time yeah i love enchiladas <laughs> not only is this recipe quick and easy it's absolutely delicious mm. When you get a bite of that onion with all the combination, good Lord loves me. Hello and welcome back. I just got off of work and I turned my oven at 400 degrees. And while I wait for Cloud to get out of work and give you better angles, I'm going to show you how I prep a delicious chicken that makes it easier for a weekday meal. I have a total of six chicken breasts, which I sliced in half for faster cooking, and I'm gonna place them into our Ziploc bag. This is one of those recipes that always helps me for meal prep, so I'm gonna go ahead and make two portions. I'm gonna start seasoning our chicken with half a tablespoon of ground cumin, half a tablespoon of black pepper, one heaping teaspoon of smoked paprika, half a tablespoon of garlic powder, one teaspoon of clove, one tablespoon of salt, the juice of two limes, half of an onion, half a cup of parsley, half a cup of cilantro, and three tablespoons of olive oil. Fully combine all your ingredients, place it in your refrigerator overnight for best flavor, but if you really need it, go ahead and let it rest for one hour. And after you're done marinating your chicken, you can split it up to cook for that day, and you can freeze some for later on in the week like we're doing today. So hopefully this is gonna thaw out by the time Cloud gets here so that I can give her a beautiful and delicious meal that she deserves. She's been working really hard. And the other thing that I like to prep is I like to pre-boil potatoes and keep them in a little Ziploc bag especially when I buy a big, large amount at Costco. I got these for, I think, eight or nine dollars. It's five pounds. And these little creamers are delicious and they will save you throughout the week. Now I'm gonna show you how to make a real delicious sauce that goes perfect with just about anything. You can even substitute it for your mayonnaise, for your sandwiches, and let me tell you, your kids are gonna be super happy. So what you wanna do is you wanna add a small bunch of cilantro into your little blender. You're gonna add a small bunch of parsley one jalapeño, two garlic cloves, about half a cup of mayonnaise, half a 
half a cup of plain yogurt and if you don't have plain yogurt you can also use uh, crema fresca or some sour cream the juice of one lime and the lime will also help preserve it so that it can last you about five to seven days in the refrigerator if your kids don't get a hold of it. My kids love to dip their little carrot sticks in here and they just have so much fun with that. You're going to add one teaspoon of black pepper, one teaspoon of salt, and then you're going to get ready to dance because you have to blend this until it's nice and smooth. And the best part is that you can freeze this sauce. Just make sure that when you're done thawing it out, you put it in a bottle and give it a good shake. Kind of like our blender dance. So if you find out that your family loves this recipe as much as mine does, you're gonna wanna make double batches of everything. Seal it up and put it in the freezer for the Views Club and me. Place your pre-cooked potatoes onto your baking dish. And for this part, I'm gonna use a potato masher. You just need something heavy, even a glass cup to press down on your potatoes like this and give it a little bit of a mash. This is a dinner that I've been making more often for my family and my boys requested I make it again so it's become <laughs> a family favorite. And since my boys are getting older and becoming super health conscious, um, I have to change up the way that I make the recipes and still make it comfortable for them with a lot of love. Drizzle a little bit of olive oil over the top don't be too heavy because we're going to finish these off with something that you're all going to love. Sprinkle a little bit of salt over the top. Somebody's going to get a really salty potato on that one. <laughs> Whoever gets that one has to wash the dishes. <laughs> and you just want to place your deliciously marinated chicken into your baking dish. Last time I made this, the kids wanted a little bit more of the onions. They get nice and soft and just adds a beautiful touch and flavor when you combine all of this meal. So I'm gonna give them a little bit more cebollitas today. And now you wanna bake your chicken and your potatoes at 400 degrees for 35 to 40 minutes. And you're gonna say that's really high heat to be baking your chicken. Don't worry, we're in a rush. We gotta make dinner and the kids are not gonna complain, especially with that delicious sauce that I just showed you how to make. Now to enhance the flavor of our potatoes, I'm gonna melt four tablespoons of butter. Once your butter melts, you're gonna add half a tablespoon of garlic powder. Ah, our potatoes smell delicious. They look beautiful and I'm so hungry. I was a little bit stressed out at work today, but you know, I'm getting by and i just need something delicious to eat today and potatoes are so comforting that i'm like i might eat all of these the kids aren't going to get any <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> pour your melted butter over your potatoes and then give it a loving mix the aromas that are coming out of this little bowl right here are enough to satiate the whole world and boom, done. Our beautiful, delicious, and juicy chicken is ready. Let me show you how I like to serve this for my family. And boom, done. Who's ready for a bite? I'm going to need somebody very special to say, uh... And there you have it, a beautiful and easy dinner for your whole family to enjoy. Mm. Hello and welcome. We're back with another delicious slow cooker recipe. If you love beef, if you love potatoes, you're gonna love this recipe because it's juicy, tender, and it's gonna fall apart in your mouth. Before you start prepping all your ingredients, you want to place your slow cooker on high. You're going to add one tablespoon of lard or olive oil. This recipe works great with three to four pounds of chuck roast, two tomatoes, two large potatoes, one medium onion, one poblano pepper, two garlic cloves, one and a half tablespoons of chicken bouillon, half a tablespoon of ground cumin, one teaspoon of black pepper, one tablespoon of Mexican oregano, a small bunch of cilantro. Give all your ingredients a loving mix. Add 
add half a cup of water. And now you're gonna slow cook for seven to eight hours on low. And boom, done an easy and delicious carne guisada in your slow cooker. The aromas that are coming out of this pot are so comforting. And who wouldn't want to come home to a slow cooked beefy and potato dinner? Let me show you how I like to serve this for my family. Have some whole pinto beans and a tortilla. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say ah. Uh. And there you have it, a super easy and delicious meal that your whole family can enjoy. Mm. Oh, that's so good. Hello and welcome back. Today we're making a Mexican street corn chowder and don't skip too far ahead because we're going to be doing a dual recipe. I'm going to be showing you how to keep your chicken tenders juicy and crispy. A lot of you know how much I love corn and I tend to get very corny and this recipe is perfect for people like me. You're going to need four to six fresh corn on the cob and you're going to have to start peeling. It's just beautiful. I love corn. If you love corn, let me know in the comments. It's the season for corn all year long, but here in the States, summertime is sweet corn time. So whatever corn you get a hold of, that's what you're going to be using. And once you've cleaned up your corn, you're going to start shaving off your kernels. Ooh, that just went right through. Flip it over and do the same to the other side. And keep one of your cobs because we're gonna be adding more flavor into our chowder. And for those of you that currently don't have access to corn on the cob, don't worry, you can use two 16 ounce frozen corns and this recipe will work out just as good. I've had the Kamikoto knife set for over a year. It comes in a beautiful heavy duty ash box that will look nice on any kitchen counter. Each box set has a five inch utility knife, a seven inch nakiri vegetable knife, and a 8.5 inch slicing knife. Making this a perfect set for all your chopping and slicing needs and perfect for gifting. I'm starting off by using the five inch utility knife to quickly chop our onions. I like that I'm able to get through the chopping quickly without crying. With the same knife, remove the stem and the seeds from your bell pepper and chop into cubes. Since I've been slicing and chopping with the Sweet Angel Kamikoto knives, poking fun of my dull knives is a thing of the past. They've helped me truly shine in the kitchen. Look at how sharp and precise I can slice through this Anaheim Chile. It's truly amazing. It must be because the Kamikoto knives are made with high quality Japanese steel and use traditional techniques. Wow, now I know why they maintain their sharpness. Let's start making our Mexican street corn chowder by placing our pan on a medium heat and adding two tablespoons of butter. Once your butter melts, you're gonna add your chopped onion, half a red bell pepper, two minced garlic cloves. Mix that gently and continue to cook for another four minutes and make sure you come and stir periodically. Next, you're gonna add one tablespoon of all-purpose flour. Give that a loving mix and continue cooking for another minute to a minute and a half. Add your roasted Anaheim pepper two potatoes, one-fourth of a cup of cilantro, and five cups of chicken broth. You're also going to add the corn cobs, and you're going to continue cooking for 10 minutes. And I'm going to show you a tip that I like to share with anybody that I talk to. In here I have one tablespoon of maseca, which is instant corn masa. What I like to do is I like to add water. You're going to need one to two tablespoons of water and just mix, mix, mix until it's well combined. Anytime you're making anything that has corn in it and you want to enhance the flavor of the corn, especially in a soup, this is going to work wonderfully to enhance the flavor of your corn. After 10 minutes, you're going to add your maseca and water mixture, one teaspoon of white pepper, 
And if you don't have white pepper, that's okay. You can use black pepper. One fourth of a cup of mayonnaise. And then you want to start mixing your ingredients. Add your corn. Lower your temperature to a medium low heat and start adding one cup of heavy whipping cream. If you don't have heavy whipping cream, you can use half and half. And if you don't have one or the other, you can use your crema fresca. You're gonna continue cooking for another 15 minutes to allow all of our flavors to fall in love with each other. And you don't wanna put the lid fully on it because it's gonna boil over, so just keep it nice and cracked. And over here, I'm just roasting some more corn. I've cooked it for about five minutes and Right when I see that it's nice and warm in there, I'm gonna add about one tablespoon of butter to finalize the roasting. And just when you think this recipe can't get any better, it does. Our friends and long-term partners at Kamikoto are giving each and every one of you $50 off of your purchase by clicking this link and using your views discount code and boom, done. You want to wait about 20 to 30 seconds in between adding your chicken tenders. That way your oil doesn't get too cold. Your chicken tenders should only take about four minutes to fully cook. So when you cook on one side, for about two to two and a half minutes, you wanna go ahead and flip them. And when they have a beautiful golden brown color, that means that they're ready to come out. Juicy and fully cooked to perfection. And boom, done. Our Mexican street corn chowder is ready. And now we're ready to serve. I'm gonna add some extra roasted corn over the top. Pico de gallo, cotija cheese, some tajin, and a few drops of your favorite hot sauce. And your desired amount of crispy chicken tenders. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say ah. Uh. And just like that, you have a perfect and easy dinner that your whole family can enjoy. You can have your soup on its own, but I personally like to dip my tenders in there. Mmm, that is absolutely delicious. Now look away, cause it's about to get dangerous. Hello and welcome. The kids are out of school and they're super hungry all the time. Today we're gonna make them a lunch that's gonna keep their bellies full and make them super happy. Now you have a choice of using refried beans or your favorite beef filling. Today I'm gonna be using our barbacoa recipe. Now let's get started. What I have in this bowl is our glue. We use this to seal our taquitos and for our chimichangas. It's a mixture of flour and water, and you're gonna mix it until it's nice and smooth and pasty like this. Take some glue. You're gonna add some Mexican cheese blend, some juicy barbacoa, fold and wrap. And then you're gonna place this part down on your beautiful tray. Same thing for our delicious refried beans. Oh, they smell so good. <laughs> and we're gonna continue with the remaining mini chimis. I'm gonna be making a lot. I have my whole family over today and we're just gonna enjoy these little fried chimichangas. We have a bunch of kids here today. We do. They're gonna love me so much that they're gonna 
put the dishes in the dishwasher <laughs> and then wait until they're done and put it away. With an uncoated wooden spoon, chopstick, or your toothpicks, you're gonna test your oil. I've been warming up my oil on a medium heat with a cast iron and we're gonna check how hot it is. We're ready to fry. Now, I only use canola oil for frying, but make it comfortable for your home. Now you're gonna place your mini chimneys gently into your oil and they do fry quickly since we're using flour tortilla. So please be gentle with yourself. I mean, they're so cute, they're irresistible. I can't, this is gonna be delicious. When your oil's hot enough, you're gonna count about 30 seconds and then you're gonna turn it. Let's go ahead and start turning them. You see, they have that little golden color. That's beautiful. It shouldn't take you more than a minute and a half to two minutes to fry these to perfection, so hang tight. And just like that, we have beautifully fried mini chimneys. And whenever I have any kind of broth, whether I'm making chicken, beef, or pork, I use that broth to make some beautiful uh, sopitas de fideo. And I call anything that's in those little packets fideo, these are the conchas. But it's super easy to make and perfect to serve with this recipe. We're gonna place our chimichangas in a little pyramid and just have fun with it. Your iceberg lettuce, some guacamole, press it down nicely, some delicious pico de gallo, and some crema fresca. You can place your soup right on the side. And who's ready for a delicious bite? I'm gonna need somebody very special to say uh in mexican culture it's a custom to have your food with a little bit of soup or a consomme and this works perfectly so remember don't throw any of your broth away use it for a fideo even if you have to have consomme you can sprinkle a little bit of cabbage on the top it's going to be delicious but we're ready to dig it i'm warning you guys it's going to get dangerous and once you take a bite you want to dip it into a little bit of your broth mm. This is absolutely delicious. Remember, if you're cooking alone, play some music, play our videos, let us know and we'll reply to you in the comments, but this is definitely something you can make week after week after week. Mm. If you have a lot of family over during the holidays or the summertime, make sure to have a lot of beans, a little bit less beef, and that we can balance out between one chimichanga with beans, one with barbacoa or your choice of filling, and then with the sopita, they're gonna be filled. They're gonna be ready for a nap and then you get to take a bath, watch your favorite program, and relax. Mm. So good. And make sure to wash it down with a delicious watermelon. Agua fresca. Salud. Hello and welcome back to Views on the Road. Today we're going to make an old-fashioned Mexican dinner and we're going to start by placing three pounds of beef into our Instant Pot. Two chile guajillos. Make sure to remove the stems and the seeds. One fourth of an onion, three garlic cloves, two bay leaves, one teaspoon of Mexican oregano, one teaspoon of black pepper, one heaping teaspoon of salt, and four cups of water. And now you're going to pressure cook for 30 minutes and you're going to allow a slow release. And while our beef is cooking in the Instant Pot, I'm gonna get started on some easy dinner flour tortillas. 
the recipe that I'm using today is our most recent one and it seems to have been able to help a lot of you so go ahead and check it out if you haven't and boom done our beef is ready go ahead and start removing your beef pieces and as far as a broth don't get rid of it you can make a fideo soup which is a classic simple recipe now the onions that are in here you can keep them with what we're gonna make but I'm gonna keep that for my soup and I'm gonna start taking out our garlic cloves we are gonna need those and what I'm gonna do with the remaining broth I will be blending everything together the onions whatever is left over from the beef and our chilies and I'm gonna be using that for the broth for our soup shred your beef and it doesn't have to be too thin just simple pieces just like this some of them are going to be smaller, but this is what you're looking for. For those of you that have an Instant Pot, remember that you can place this beef in the morning before you have to go to work. You can start cooking it and allow it to be in a slow pressure release and just keep it there until you get home. And it's going to be nice and warm and perfect and it's going to be even more tender than this. Place your burner on a medium heat and drizzle about half a tablespoon of oil. Remember watching the cooking shows and you're like, that's more than one tablespoon. Every time. <laughs> and karma has hit us because people tell us that now. It's more <laughs> than this. That's funny. I used to think that too. Yeah. Once your oil gets warm, you're going to add half a sliced onion, two Anaheim peppers, and two tomatoes. And if you can find Anaheim, pick your favorite green chili. We're going to continue to cook our ingredients for another four to six minutes until our onions are translucent and our tomatoes are nice and soft. Once your ingredients are nice and soft, you're going to start adding your shredded beef. Give that a loving mix. Our beef is so juicy. I got a really good cut this time. I'm so excited. <laughs> I saved some of the broth that we blended with all the onion and all the extra stuff and you're just going to pour just a little bit. We're going to go with about half a cup. You want to make sure that you serve this juicy and not dry. So if for some reason you make this early on in the day and you want to serve it uh, later for dinner, you can cook it and then save your broth. And when you warm it up, you can add that broth that we added and it's going to keep it nice and juicy for you. This is also the time where you can adjust salt to taste. If you want to use chicken bouillon or if you want to use salt, for us, we kept it with salt. Keep it nice and light. And I'm going to be using about half a teaspoon of salt. Once you've combined all your ingredients, you're going to continue to cook for another 8 to 10 minutes on a medium low heat. And boom, done. We are ready to serve. Look at how delicious that looks. This is so comforting for me. I'm going to feast today, you guys. And you serve this with your Mexican rice and some creamy smooth beans. And right when you serve your beans, you want to add your cheese so it can get nice and melty. Some of you think you're not going to eat a little bit of a salad. You're just going to make a little space here. And you're going to eat your salad. Don't look at me like that with the tomatoes. I know you have them on top of your Taco Bell tacos. This is no different. You're going to eat them. And you're going to need some freshly made flour tortillas. Here we have our soup, our fideo, and all I'm going to do to that is I'm going to add a little bit of onions and cilantro to the top. And any kind of barbacoa, birria, any beef broth that you have left over, you can always use it for an extra dish, just like this. I'm going to need somebody very special to say, ah. Uh... Mmm. And these are the old-fashioned dishes that really bring comfort to your home. I grew up eating carne de cebrada, shredded beef, and honestly, I don't think I can stop. So I hope that you guys enjoy this dish as much as our family does because it's absolutely delicious.
hello and welcome back. I hope that you love a slow cooked, tender, juicy barbecue as much as I do. And in order to achieve that at home, you're gonna need a slow cooker. So go ahead and place your slow cooker on high, add one tablespoon of lard, and make sure to stick around to the end because I'll be showing you how to make a salsa verde coleslaw that goes perfect with your barbecue sandwiches, your tacos, and it's sure to hold you through the summer. And before we get started with this recipe, I don't want you to feel limited. This recipe and seasoning works best with beef, pork, or chicken. So if you decide to slather some on some shrimp, it's gonna taste delicious. And even those of you that love tofu, it works perfectly. This recipe is good for eight to 10 pounds of pork. Once you get your big piece of pork butt, you wanna chop it into smaller pieces. Season with one teaspoon of salt and one tablespoon of black pepper. Make sure that all your pieces are coated with the seasoning. And then you're gonna add them right into your slow cooker with that nice hot lard. Okay, leave this here without touching anything and let's go and blend our sauce. Now to make our barbecue sauce, you're gonna to need to use four chiles guajillos and four chiles anchos. If you don't have access to your ancho chiles, you can find some pasillas that have a similar flavor, but let me tell you, the ancho, once you toast it, remove your seeds and the stem, it's gonna bring out a flavor that's gonna pop in your mouth once you take a bite out of that pork. Soak your chiles in some hot water. That should take you eight to 10 minutes or until they're nice and soft. To your blender, you're gonna add your guajillo chiles, ancho chiles, three cloves, one tablespoon of Mexican oregano, one tablespoon of ground cumin, two tablespoons of chicken bouillon, three fourths of a cup of apple cider vinegar, half a cup of water, and now you wanna blend until smooth. And boom, done. And you're just gonna pour your sauce right over all your pieces of pork. Any sauce left over in your blender, just add a little bit of water. Get all that sauce out. You're just gonna give that a loving mix to make sure that every single piece is coated. You're gonna add four garlic cloves, one sliced onion, three bay leaves, Combine all your ingredients. And now you're gonna cook on low for eight hours. And boom, done, our barbecue is ready. And just by me mixing, it's pretty much shredding our barbecue. Just perfect. So you get a little bit of shredded, a little bit of chunks, and it's just gonna allow it to melt in your mouth. Add a little bit of extra onions, cilantro, pickled purpled onions, and a little squeeze of lime juice. If you're like me, you like good gossip. So if you want your family to gossip about you at your barbecue, go ahead and chop one green apple and add that to your slaw. You wanna pick your favorite buns, but these are the ones that my kids like, and that's what I chose today. Toast your buns slightly, that way you make sure that it doesn't get too soaked up, unless you like that kind of thing. Then soak it up. I really love how sneaky the onion is in here. Ooh. And boom, done. A delicious barbecue sandwich. Cheers. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say ah. Uh... And there you have it. An easy and delicious barbecue that you can make any time of the year. This is a perfect meal prep recipe for you guys. And let me tell you, don't skip on that coleslaw. It's going to be a game changer for your barbacoa tacos. And I hope you guys enjoy this recipe as much as I enjoy cooking it for you. Mmm. Wow. And I do want to let you guys know that this recipe, I made it so that it's not too spicy or over seasoned, but that it still pulls a lot of flavor. Because when you're presenting something at a barbecue, everybody's going to be like, I don't like this. I do like this. And this one, it's going to be neutral. Everybody's going to talk about it. They're going to ask you how you made it. And don't be shy to tell them where you got the recipe. Just give them our link. And when you make this taco and you take a bite out of it, I want you to think of me and say a little prayer. Because this taco is going to transform the way you enjoy your barbacoa.
from the soft, tender, juicy barbecue to that crunch you get from your coleslaw with the hint of lime. It's not too spicy. It's not boring. It's absolutely delicious. Hello and welcome. Today you're gonna to learn a new way to enjoy your beef stew. Now let's get this recipe on the road by slicing our beef. Today I'm using New York beef loin, but if you don't have the New York beef loin, you can also use chuck or ribeye. I'm gonna take off the fat from our beef and I'm gonna be using that for chicharrones. If you've never had beef chicharrones, I'll link a recipe in the description and it's perfect for tacos. I find that when I'm making any kind of beefy stew, my family will start crying about, oh, it's too much fat and you kind of just want to bite into it. So let's give our family what they want. And that's what they sound like when they're complaining. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> and you just want to cube your beef. If you have a lot of little ones at home, you can make them into smaller little cubes. But well, my boys are hunky and they require big bites. And I'm hunky too. <laughs> and then you just want to place that into your bowl. Now to your two pounds of beef, you're going to add one and a half teaspoons of ground cumin, one and a half teaspoons of black pepper, half a tablespoon of salt, two minced garlic cloves, half a tablespoon of olive oil, and you're going to fully combine all your ingredients. Once you fully combine your ingredients, you're going to add one tablespoon of all purpose flour. Give that a loving mix. And once you're done mixing your beautiful beef, you're gonna let this set for a minimum of 10 minutes. And while we allow this to set, we're gonna go over the vegetables that I'll be using for today's stew. We're gonna be sauteing half of an onion and one tomato. And for the vegetables, you wanna use your favorite vegetables. I have half a cup of corn, 13 green beans, an Anaheim pepper, one large carrot, one medium zucchini, and one fourth of a cabbage. You're gonna need three to four cups of bone broth. If you don't have freshly made bone broth, that's okay. I'm gonna leave a tip and a suggestion for you in the description area. And what would a stew be without some potatoes? I have two russet potatoes here and now it's time to get cooking. Place your burner on a medium high heat and allow it to warm up for three minutes if you're using a cast iron. If you're using a different style pan, go ahead and allow it to warm up for a minute and a half. Once your cast iron gets nice and hot, you're gonna add half a tablespoon of olive oil. Next, you're gonna add your beef and you're gonna sear for a good three to four minutes. Make sure not to move anything around for the next four minutes, hang tight. After four minutes, you're gonna add your onions and your tomato. You're gonna give it a loving mix and you're gonna continue to cook for four more minutes. Next, you're gonna add your potatoes, corn, and your remaining veggies. I know some of you are looking at this and you're looking scared because of the vegetables. Don't, it's delicious, you're gonna love it. Now give all your ingredients a loving and gentle mix. Add your beef broth. Half a tablespoon of Mexican oregano. Go ahead and give that another loving mix. Once your pot reaches a boil, you're gonna switch your burner to a medium heat and continue to cook for 30 minutes. Make sure to come and stir periodically. I don't want anybody to burn this stew because it's delicious and you deserve to try it. 
give or take 30 to 35 minutes, our stew is ready. You wanna go ahead and turn your burner off and you wanna sprinkle a little bit of chopped cilantro. Give that a loving mix. And we have a little bit of a cold front where I live, so this recipe is gonna be perfect to warm up my family. And just like that, we're ready to serve a delicious beef and vegetable stew. Make sure that your beans are nice and smooth. That way it's easier for your body to digest. And this stew pairs great with some delicious Mexican red rice. A little queso fresco and we're ready to eat. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say uh. And just like that, you have a beautiful and delicious beef stew to serve your family. And I don't want you to feel limited and use the exact vegetables that I did. Sometimes you have a lot of vegetables that you need to use that are in your refrigerator and this is a perfect recipe for that. Mmm. Mmm. -hmm. This stew is absolutely delicious and biting into the corn kernels really amplifies the flavor of this stew. And I know it's gonna be a good seller for your kids. Make sure that you make a little bit extra so you can pack yourself some for lunch or your loved ones. Mmm. I love a good beefy stew. That's really good. Hello and welcome back to Views on the Road. I'm your host Steph and today we're making pot roast. It's cold outside and a lot of you just wanna snuggle in bed and warm your little hearts up and this is a perfect recipe for you. And you already know, we're gonna give it a Steph twist. We're gonna start by seasoning our beef. You're gonna start adding your salt, black pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, and sprinkle some flour. Then you're gonna turn it over and we're gonna do the same thing. And leave it to me to use the smallest plate. And you just wanna make sure that all sides of your beef is coated with your seasoning. And while you're coating your beef with your seasoning, you wanna place your burner on a medium high heat. I'm gonna be using cast iron, so that's gonna warm up in about two, three minutes. You're gonna add about two to three tablespoons of olive oil. If you don't have olive oil, that's okay. Use whatever oil you're comfortable with and you have access to. And now I'm just gonna let the olive oil get nice and hot for about another minute, minute and a half. And now it's time to sear our beef. So go ahead and carefully place your beef in your pan and you're gonna sear for about eight to 10 minutes. You wanna move your beef every four minutes and make sure that all of the sides are seared. You're gonna add one cup of water and if you have chicken or beef broth, you can use that, chicken bouillon. And now that I have space on my pan, I'm gonna go ahead and cook our onions until they're translucent and that's gonna be about four minutes. And don't forget that when you're searing or cooking, just clean as you go because once the oil sticks, it's a nightmare to get off. And now you're gonna place your onions into your slow cooker. And on this plate, I have tomato, poblano, and carrots. Your potatoes. And for me, a combination of tomatoes and tomato sauce always does the trick, so you're gonna add one can of tomato sauce. And I'm gonna add a little bit of water just so that all that tomato sauce can go straight to the bottom. Now you're gonna slow cook. I like to press warm so that way when I come down in the morning with my coffee, I get to pick at this delicious soft and tender beef. If you're like me, let me know in the comments and I'll see you when it's ready. And boom, done. Our beef is nice, tender, and fall apart. Look at that. As you can see, I already picked at it. Our potatoes are nice and soft and so are the carrots. Just beautiful. And even the parts with the fat just fall apart. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful. And we're gonna be preparing our pot roast with a delicious oregano rice. You can't go wrong with it. So you're gonna go ahead and place your burner on a medium heat and you're gonna add about one tablespoon of oil. Today I'm using olive oil. I've been on an olive oil kick. Let me know if you guys have been doing the same. You're gonna add your rice. 
Give that a loving mix and continue cooking until it's nice and toasty. That should take you about three minutes or so. Once you toast your rice, you want to add your water. Make sure you're following the directions on your package, but if you're in a humid area, you want to use a little bit less than suggested. Your salt, Mexican oregano, squeeze the juice of half a lime or lemon, give your rice a loving mix, and you're going to bring up to a boil. Once your pot hits a boil, you're going to lower your temperature to a simmer and continue cooking as suggested on your package. And boom, done. Our rice is nice and fluffy, fully cooked, and you just want to give it a quick mix. That way your Mexican oregano gets in touch with all the grains of rice. And although this pot roast tastes delicious as is, I like to add a few ingredients that really bring out the flavor even more. Sprinkle a little bit of cilantro, fresh onions, your choice of salsa, a little bit of lime juice, and a little bit of avocado. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say ah. Uh... And this is a perfect recipe for those of you that just wanna enjoy your time off. You can set it on a Friday and then you can eat this throughout the weekend and you don't have anything to worry about. You can alternate it between burritos, tostadas, and you can even place it over your mashed potatoes because I know that a lot of you like it, but try it with the rice first and then let me know. Buen provecho. Thank you. Mmm. Ooh, what is that? Some tea. Mmm. It's not sweet, but it's delicious. And don't forget to eat your veggies. Mmm. The warmth of this pot roast and the flavors are so comforting to me. I hope that you guys love it as much as I do. Hello and welcome back. Today we're making a no fuss, crunchy, beefy dinner. Just make sure to have at least one pound of ground beef and your favorite taco seasoning. Place your burner on a medium high heat and add one tablespoon of lard or your favorite oil. Add your ground beef and start breaking it down. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of Kinder taco seasoning. It's my favorite one. It just, it tastes like home. So good. And break it down some more with that seasoning. Mmm, it's already starting to smell so good in this house. You want to continue to cook for another four to six minutes. And boom, done. Our ground beef is ready. You're going to take your tostada and add some beans to it. Add your desired amount of ground beef. Some salsa some huacatillo, place it right over the top, freshly shredded lettuce, Mexican cheese blend, delicious pico de gallo, and your choice of crema fresca or sour cream. I'm gonna need somebody very special to say ah. Uh... And there you have it, a quick and easy dinner, giving you more time to enjoy your family. Mm. Look away because this is about to get really dangerous. Mm. That's so good. Mmm. It's absolutely delicious. As always, Claude and I are wishing you the best. We hope you have a safe and peaceful weekend. And on that one, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye!